Book Three, Chapter Three of the Sworn Brothers A Tale of the Early Days of Iceland by Gunnar Gunnarsson. Translation by Claude Field and W. M. A. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. The summer they spent in South Svein Fjord was, for the brothers and their wives, an unbroken succession of beautiful days. There was a peculiar atmosphere of peace and prosperity about the lonely settlement, where the fire burnt day and night under the cliff behind the tents, while on a rising ground close at hand their winter dwelling rose slowly from the ground. It was a house sixty feet in length, thirty in breadth, which the brothers were having built, a house with thick turf walls for a protection against the cold of winter, and adapted to be partitioned according to their needs, when they had first roofed it in. While their men worked at the dwelling, and gathered in hay as winter fodder for the cattle, in golf and leaf let the days come and go, and whether they were sunny days, or the fog hung in grey soft gliding belts down to the middle of the mountain sides, all the days had a peculiar solemn solitariness and charm about them. The land they had come to was after Leif's heart. It made quite a different impression on him to any other land he had visited. The sense of power that brooded over it, and the almost palpable solitude, swallowed up the unrest of his mind and gave him peace. The mountains strongly marked and infinitely varied shapes, a little copse hidden among grey cliffs, close up to a glacier, the heavily pouring rivers in deep ravines, the fjords where the swans swam, among other fowls, like royal dragon ships, among peaceful freighters, a seal bathing in the sun on a rock by the fjord, not wise enough to be afraid of men, the countless birds' nests with the snugly hidden, different-coloured eggs one came across everywhere and then the soft downy young ones hopping about between little hillocks all filled his soul with a sense of wonder and calm hitherto unknown ingolf and leif made little excursions on their horses in the neighbourhood they soon ascertained that the fjords north of the svanfjords were very poor in pasture land the mountains descended for the most part steeply to the sea while the land, on the other hand, seemed to become better the farther southward they went. When they had made that discovery, they equipped themselves for a journey of some days in order to examine the land south of the Svein fjords more closely. Over a low stony stretch of tableland they came to another inlocked fjord, which was much broader than even the broad south Svein fjord. The greater part of the upland of this fjord was, however, covered with gravel and clay. Quite outside by the sea was a stretch of luxuriant meadow, and here and there stood rock islets amid the sand, round which there were large green pastures. Farther up, right under the mountains, there was also pasture land, and there they found the largest and most luxuriant wood they had yet seen. They came to a river with many rapidly flowing courses, which streamed with clay-colored, turbid water over a sandy and unsafe bottom. But they had caught sight of some sharp mountain peaks, far to the southwest, and since it could scarcely be difficult to cross the ravines between them, they resolved to proceed thither, and see what was to be found on the other side. It was generally the case with this land that one was not satisfied till one had seen what there was on the other side of all the mountains which came in view. They passed with some difficulty the dangerous river current, and rode farther along high steep mountain declivities striped with many-coloured gravel. They found a ravine between the mountain peaks, and when they had reached the other side of the mountains, there opened on them, while they rode along the edge of the steep descents which led down to the lowland, a view, the like of which they had never seen. 
a fjord dotted with small green islands, wide-stretching meadows and pastures intersected by gleaming watercourses, a wide bluish ring of mountains which locked in the luxuriant region with a mighty curve, and behind all this in the south and west glaciers an immense slightly arched stretch of sparkling snow with white offshoots to all ravines it was on a clear sunny day at noon that they stood there and surveyed this region which arrested their minds with a sense of solemn wonder and irresistible fascination such as no view had ever done before in his rapture leif laid his hand upon ingolf's shoulder and pressed it he had tears in his eyes, and his large mouth quivered. They had dismounted from their horses and stood silent for a long time, and when they mounted again to examine the district further, they rode on in silence. From that hour they were Icelanders, the land was theirs, and they belonged to it. In silence the compact was finally and irrevocably solemnized. When they came back from their trip, Halveg and Helga had an important and, as they themselves thought, serious piece of news to tell them. They had one day climbed up the green ascent above the encampment, quite up to the base of the cliffs, in order to get a wider view over the fjord and the district. And just as they sat and contemplated the low group of islands and a little island beyond it, they saw smoke rising from the island. It had been a perfectly calm and clear day. There could be no doubt that they had seen correctly. They had not said anything to the men, and they now only wished to ask Ingolf and Leif to be careful, and not to go about any more alone. Ingolf and Leif immediately put the larger of the two boats in the water, called some of their men, and bade them take their weapons with them. They wished to find out what kind of people they had for neighbors. It was in vain that Halvig and Helga begged and prayed them not to insist on going out, and least of all in a little rowing boat. The brothers were too resolved on finding out more about the smoke from the island. In answer to their wives they objected that the ship was too unwieldy, and was, moreover, not a ship of war. There was scarcely any chance of fighting. If there were people on the island, there were probably some peaceful, starving, shipwrecked men, whose vessel had been driven to sea and lost. For the rest, they promised to be careful, but they were resolved to go out to the island that day. So they rowed out thither. Even when they had got quite close to it, they could see no sign that it was inhabited. They rowed round it and still saw no inhabitants or buildings. They determined to land, and chose a creek on the south side of the island. As soon as they had landed, they saw a wretched little boat, in which they would hardly have trusted themselves to cross a fjord, hidden among the rocks. They went farther up on the island, and found a hut well concealed in a hollow. As they approached, a man came forth in a splendid cloak and headdress, with a staff in his hands, and followed by some lean shapes, black with dirt, and meanly clad. They came out from the hut, but remained standing before the door, without going towards them. They had seen this kind of people before, and immediately perceived that they had what were called Irish monks before them. Both Leif and Ingolf, as well as several of their men, knew some Irish, and therefore went nearer in order to hear a little why these people dwelt here on a desert island. The monks, one of whom carried a cup of water, evidently did not wish them to come too near them or their dwelling. The sworn brothers remained standing at some distance and questioned them. The monks answered their questions reluctantly, but they gathered from them that they had lived here for several years, that they had long since heard reports of this land, and that other monks before them had journeyed to seek it out. They had not seen any of them, but the land was wide, and they had remained here on the island where they had first landed. This information Ingolf at last extracted from the monks, with many questions answered, for the most part in monosyllables. When the brothers could not think of anything more to ask them, and were going down to their boat again, the man with the headdress, cloak, and staff stopped them with a question. 
Why had they come hither? Ingolf told them that they had come here to look at the land, and intended to settle here. His words aroused a movement and disturbance among the monks, and their leader gave him to understand plainly that the land was sanctified and reserved by God for Christian men. No heathen had ever settled here, nor ever could. Every kind of misfortune would strike them if they migrated hither, unless they first let themselves be baptized and went over to the Christian faith. Ingolf answered them quietly that they must grant him that it would ill become him to be less faithful to his gods than they were to theirs. The monk answered that he then did not trust in gods but in idols. Ingolf answered that the aces had hitherto protected him and his family. Then, bidding them farewell, he went off, followed by Leif and his men. They saw the monks sprinkling with water the places where they had trod. Then Ingolf smiled and Leif laughed aloud. The monks sprinkled even the waves which had licked the heathen's boat. When Ingolf and Leif returned, they were able to quiet Halveg and Helga with the news that they were peaceful and harmless people who inhabited the little island. Their only weapon was a little water in a cup. After that they called the island Monk's Island. When the autumn came with cold and sleet, the sworn brothers already sat warm in their turf house. Before the dwelling, Ingolf had caused to be built a smaller edifice, where he set up small, roughly carved wooden images of Odin and Thor. And when the time for the autumn sacrificial feast was come, he offered them an ox. They must share the offering as best they could, and had a little feast. Leif held aloof from all things of that sort. During the twenty-four hours of the feast he went out catching birds by day and slept quietly in his bed by night. In his lonely wanderings the brown leaves of the autumn rustled round his feet and spoke to him. Leif did not think much about catching birds. He enjoyed being alone with the mountains and the blue sky. Wherever he met a family of grouse who held faithfully together, he let them go. He only aimed at solitary birds, caught them round the neck with a practiced fling of his light line, and drew them to himself with one sweep through the air. Ingolf's sacrificial feast and all his devotion to the gods was a continually recurring trial to Leif's brotherly feeling. He could not reconcile himself to Ingolf's constant and devoted adherence to the worship of these ugly wooden idols. Time after time he was obliged, in order to control his rising displeasure, to remind himself that Ingolf never interfered in his beliefs and thoughts concerning the gods, and therefore had a right to expect the same from him. But in his heart Leif scorned and despised Ingolf's gods, and it was inevitable that some of this violent antipathy should sometimes glance on his brother. Singularly enough, on the other hand, Leif did not take it at all ill that Helga held fast to her own and her father's faith, without its being clear to him that he possessed in that, as it were, a proof of her steadfastness. He did not at all wish that Helga should forsake her gods to follow him in his want of faith and contempt for them. The day that she did so would have given a severe blow to Leif's happiness. So, and no otherwise, was his nature. The winter came with hard frost, but without much snow. The weather for skiing, which Ingolf and Leif were waiting for in order to show Halvig and Helga a little of the country south of the Svanfjords, did not come. Their disappointment was, however, mitigated by the fact that their sheep and goats could, contrary to expectation, go out and get their food the whole of the winter, with the exception of a few stormy days. The brothers came to the conclusion that it was a land where relatively few people might possess many sheep. They also noticed that sheep and goats, both in winter and summer, went up to the mountains and did not remain below in the luxuriant pastures. It was evident that the grass they grazed among the stones upon the apparently barren mountains must be of peculiar strength, for the sheep's bodies remained stout and their wool white. 
the goats had found some holes in the mountain near the house there they remained at night took refuge there in bad weather and were comfortable in spite of the short days and long nights and the great solitude the winter proved by no means long neither the brothers nor helveg nor helga felt the solitude oppressive it brought them into closer intimacy with each other in a way that no summer days could have done they sat round the fire, busy with their little occupations, and talked cheerfully and confidentially together. Ingolf and Leif carved wood, Halvek and Helga spun yarn, and dyed it in different shades of heather color, made mittens and handkerchiefs, or artistically woven bands of it. In the middle of the winter, Halvek gave birth to a boy, whom Ingolf sprinkled with his own hand with water, and named Thorsten after Thor, and in remembrance of his former friend Hasten, from whom fate had so painfully severed him. When Halvig had given birth to her boy, Helga became extremely solitary in soul. She never could find any sign that she was with child. When no one could see her, she wept bitter tears about it, but gave no outward sign. Outwardly, she was uniformly cheerful and bright, and showed to each and all an untroubled demeanor. It was something she kept to herself, like the scent of the pines from the islands. Spring came, with mildness in the air and vernal winds. As soon as it could be managed, the ship was launched, loaded, and made fit for sea. The sworn brothers needed as much as possible of the summer to make preparations for their migration here the next spring, to exchange those of their movable goods and the livestock which they could not take with them for useful wares, and in general to arrange their affairs in Norway before they left the country for good. All of them, except Helga, left the new land, though they had only been there a year with regret. The land had been a good friend to them, and they were loath to bid it farewell even for a short time. When they sailed away from it, it lay there so quiet and silent, gazing after them as it were. Before they departed, the migratory birds had all come back. The land lay bathed in sunshine, with cheerful bird life on the fjord and on the shore. Leif the Restless was no more eager for journeys, he would rather have remained where he was, and not have travelled to Norway at all. But even Leif had to grant that the plan was impracticable. The provisions for the journey which they had brought with them were rapidly decreasing, and, moreover, it would be difficult for Ingolf, when he came back, to find just the same spot in the land, dependent as he was on weather and sea. Besides, Leif saw clearly that Helga, though she had unhesitatingly acquiesced in his wild proposal, preferred that they should travel with the others. Helga was willing to sacrifice everything for Leif, even the scent of the pines from the islands at home. But when she gave her brave assent to remain, her self-command failed her a little, and her lips quivered slightly. The whole winter she had looked forward with joy to the moment when she should sail between the islands to Dalsfjord. Like a secret treasure, she had concealed the consciousness that that was in store for her in her steadfast heart. That remained there till Leif started with the others, but when he sailed away from the land, the old unrest was again awake in his soul. End of Book Three, Chapter Three Book Three, Chapter Four of the Sworn Brothers: A Tale of the Early Days of Iceland by Gunnar Gunnarsson, translation by Claude Field and W. M. A. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. The brothers were favored by a good wind as they crossed the sea to Norway. Only ten days after they had sailed out between the skerries outside the Span fjords, the vessel lay before Ingolf's house in Dalsfjord. When they disembarked, it was only Helga who felt as though she had come home. Ingolf and Leif had already separated themselves in their hearts from their birthplace, 
and halvig whose home was wherever ingolf was had never been intimately acquainted with this district leif had already on the return journey expressed his wish to go on a viking expedition in the summer he gave many reasons among others that he needed serfs Further, he alleged that it was the simplest way of obtaining goods for their journey to Iceland the next spring. Ingolf could arrange their affairs in Dalsfjord while he was out trading for them both. Leif spoke much about this important trading, and about his very inconvenient want of serfs. They were dear to buy, and it was easiest to take them where one could find them. All these and more reasons were adduced by Leif, but he concealed his real reason for the journey, which was that it was impossible for him to conceive how he should spend a summer at home at Dalsfjord. His blood had suddenly become restless. His mind was like a bow which had been long on the strain. Helga, who, as was her way, always left matters to Leif, made no objection to his plan. On the contrary, she gave it her warmest assent, but now it appeared that there would be no more sunshine in the summer, which would be the last she spent at home. Ingolf, for his part, knew Leif, and he was forced to admit that the arrangement was not a bad one. They certainly needed goods, and would obtain them most cheaply by fetching them themselves. For the rest, whatever private plans Leif had in his expedition were his own affair. It was thus already decided on the way that Leif should go on a Viking expedition. As soon as they landed at Dalsfjord, Leif set to work equipping himself for his expedition. He was somewhat late in that, and had therefore to hurry his preparations as much as possible. He allowed himself leisure neither for sleep nor meals. In great haste he collected all the goods which he and Ingolf had in stock, and loaded his dragon ship with them, together with the other ship which he still had in reserve. This time he had to be content with two ships, he could not well man more, and moreover they had not goods for more than two. Only a few days after his homecoming, Leif sailed out again from Dalsfjord, and left Helga alone with the pine tree scent from the islands. Leif did not guess that the pain of separation which left in his mind only a fleeting pang filled Helga with burning anxiety and unrest, which should not vanish till she had him again. Leif sailed out over the sea, and let the sea breezes, the sense of solitary independence, together with the expectation of dangers and adventures, absorb his mind. He sailed to Ireland, and traded and ravaged wherever he came. This time Ingolf had forgotten to exact any promises of caution from him. Leif had latterly appeared to him so altered that he simply had not considered it necessary. Leif was therefore completely free, unfettered by promises or considerations of any kind. And in the consciousness that this was now the last time he was on a Viking expedition, he displayed a daring and exuberance in his conduct which filled his men with joy, and sent several of them to Odin. During the summer Leif acquired more by pillaging than by commercial genius, a very large supply of all kinds of goods, mostly valuable cloths and metals. In the course of the summer he succeeded in catching ten serfs, ten wiry, grimy men, who bore names like Doftak, Gerard, Skolbjarn, Haldor, Draftdrift, and the like, sour-looking men with evil eyes, but good enough as serfs, tough at rowing as they sat chained to the oars, and enduring in all kinds of work. Luck, which only unwillingly forsakes the bold, followed Leif wherever he went. On one occasion, towards the close of the summer, it nearly went ill with him. He had landed with his men on an apparently deserted coast, which was protected by skerries and rocky islands with strong currents between them, a place which only Leif could think suitable for landing. 
he caused his ships loaded with the costly booty of the summer to be rowed in between these skerries in order to hide them in a rocky creek which he had selected during a solitary excursion while he and his men went for a foray in the neighborhood for this expedition he needed as many of his men as possible the object being a very large and presumably rich town leif left the ships in the creek with only a few men to look over the chained serfs whom he dared not allow to go free as long as he was so near their native place with the rest of his men leif went on shore and he betook himself to the wood they were all full of great excitement and expectation this was to be the last great adventure of the summer, and Leif expected a booty which might perhaps make it necessary to conquer a vessel to carry it in. Time would show. The wood they intended to cross covered a steep mountainside from the summit down to the coast, and it was traversed by deep rocky ravines covered with bushes. Leif and his men had not penetrated far into this very impassable wood, when they were attacked by an armed force far superior to their own. The people of the town must have had spies out along the coast. They were not only outwardly, but really prepared for their coming. Leif had just shouted to his men to fight each for himself, first and foremost to get away and save the ships when the enemy was on them with strident war-cries and loud clashing of weapons. Leif had no time to see how his men fared. The people of the town had at once seen who was the leader, and since it was the leader whom it was the most important to strike, they flocked round him with lifted axes and upraised swords. Leif had to sacrifice his spear to one of the two nearest attackers, the other's head he split with his axe, but next moment a swarm of howling Irish were pressing on him. They did not, however, surround him, a fact which Leif, who was striking doughtily about him with axe in one hand and sword in the other, his shield he had thrown away, had no time to think about. They pressed him back in between the trees. Leif, who at the moment only thought that six was the smallest number he could reasonably take with him to Valhalla, and was still short of two, suddenly lost his foothold. It happened so unexpectedly that his sword dropped from his hand, but with his axe he hooked himself fast to a tree root in falling, and there he hung, swinging in the air, over the edge of a ravine. His attackers had raised a great shout of victory when he fell. They now gathered on the edge of the ravine, stood there and laughed at him, and made themselves merry at his plight. They pricked at him for amusement with their spears, while in loud tones they debated which would be the most amusing way to see him die. A proposal that they should slowly prick the life out of him gained the day. So they began to prick him in turn, each of them wishing to have his share of the pleasure. Leif was in a desperate situation. He looked down at the bottom of the ravine, where there grew heather and bushes. He had no other resource than to let himself fall and see if he escaped with life. He wasted no time in reviewing the situation. He simply let go and let himself fall. At the moment he fell, he perceived that men spread themselves on both sides of him to find a way down to the ravine and to surround him there if he escaped from the fall with his life and whole limbs. The fall absorbed both his body and his thoughts. He turned two somersaults in the air and struck against something hard. There was a singing in his ears, and he fainted for a time. When he came to himself again, he was lying on his back in some high heather and staring up at the light green leaves on some scattered stunted trees. He had a distinct consciousness of danger without at once remembering where it threatened him, and grasped involuntarily after his axe and spear. He grasped in vacancy, and when he discovered that he was weaponless, the whole situation was suddenly clear to him. In an instant he was on his legs, satisfied himself that no bones were broken, picked up his helmet, 
and involuntarily stooping to half his height, set off, running as hastily as his somewhat stiff limbs allowed, into the thickest part of the wood, and took the way down to the coast. He had already run a good way when he heard men approaching, talking loudly farther down the ravine. He halted and stood stiff and motionless. Only his eyes roamed round to seek a hiding place, but he saw nothing resembling one anywhere. A little hollow in the ground close to his feet might perhaps afford room for his body, but by no means could it conceal him. With every moment that passed, while he stood there without any chance of escape, he could more distinctly hear his heart beating. He already imagined to himself how it would be to have his entrails drawn out and to be led round a tree. But at the same instant, when he was on the point of giving up and of flying up the ravine where he was quite sure to meet other foes, his eye fell on a large flat stone. There was salvation. Trembling over his whole body with excitement, he raised the stone on its edge and rolled it towards the hollow. Then he lay down, wrapped his cloak round him, shrunk himself up as well as he could, and pushed the stone right over him. There he lay, and heard his pursuers come tramping. From their talk he understood that they were quite sure that he still lay where he had fallen, and feared that he had broken his neck, so that all further amusement for them was over. All the same, they urged each other to have a good look for him. If they found the red-haired devil, he should be flayed alive. Leaf lay there under his flat stone, with a corner of his cloak between his teeth. An irresistible convulsive fit of laughter seized him, and shook his whole body. Every moment he might be prepared for them to raise the stone. He did not know whether it covered him completely. But here he lay, and there they went, rejoicing at the idea of flaying him alive. Less than that was needed to make Leaf merry. The men passed. Their voices died away gradually farther up the ravine. Leaf let some moments pass, then cautiously raised the stone. After taking a good look round, he set out, crouching as he ran to the harbour. He reached the shore without seeing more enemies. He stood for a little, recovering himself in the cool air from the sea. He was tolerably sure that they would remain so keenly on the watch that he could hardly in full daylight get to his ship, if, indeed, he still had a ship at all. It was impossible for him to know if things had gone better with his men than with himself, or if the ships had already fallen into the enemy's hands. It was really a nice mess that he had got into. When would he see Helga again? Leif let his gaze wander over the fjord, and caught sight of an island with some stunted fir trees a little distance out. This island was surrounded by smaller ones, and appeared to him at that moment very attractive. His enemies would scarcely think of looking for him outside the borders of the land. Leif did not reflect very long. He hid his cloak, helmet, and whatever might be in his way when swimming thither, piled stones up on them, and let them lie. Then he flung himself into the waves. He swam on his back the first part of the way, in order to be able to keep an eye on the land, and to see if he was noticed. He could not see the least sign of life on shore. He reached the island safe and sound, and crawled, wet and weary, up its smooth, rocky side. He dragged himself under the shelter of a stone, where he could lie and let the sun bathe him. Luckily it shone brightly and warmly, in spite of the lateness of the season. He settled himself comfortably and closed his eyes. Shortly afterwards he fell asleep. He awoke from uneasy dreams. The light of the setting sun fell dazzling on his face. He had then slept the whole day. And what sort of a coverlet was that which he had over him? Closer inspection showed it to be a grey cloak of coarse material. Leif looked round him with wide open eyes, and caught sight of a man squatting a little distance off, and regarding him with mild attentive eyes. 
Leif did not place much confidence in the mildness of his glance. Involuntarily he felt around for his weapons. There were no weapons there. Now he remembered the whole affair. But the man there seemed likewise unarmed. Also he smiled, and for the rest was so thin and wasted that he could hardly be dangerous. What sort of a man was he? He looked ragged and starving. His hair and beard were tangled like a bird's nest. There was an atmosphere of death about him. Only in his eyes and smile was there life, a gentle and, at the same time, intense life. The man rose and disappeared behind a projecting rock. Leif thought this very strange conduct, and remembered, when he was out of sight, that he had not heard his step at all. Was he still asleep and dreaming? Was it a living man he had seen, or a ghost? No, there he came again, whoever he was. He had bare legs, which explained why he walked noiselessly, and for the rest appeared altogether wretched and harmless. This time he came up close to Leif with some shellfish, which he opened with a practiced hand, merely with the help of a sharp-edged stone. Leif ate a couple of the shellfish, being ravenously hungry, and would have gladly thanked this friendly and strange man, but his disgust was too strong for him, and he declared himself satisfied. Then the strange man smiled anew, an indulgent smile, and ate the rest of the shellfish himself. When he had finished, he asked Leif how he was, if he could rise, and how he came to be lying here on his island. Leif trumped up a long story about having fallen overboard from a ship. The current had seized him, he said, and carried him hither. He found it best at the same time to show the man quite clearly, in order that he might make no mistake, that he not only could rise, but that he was altogether quite sound. The man smiled again, whether on account of his story or his slightly threatening gestures Leif was not sure, and asked him no more, but rose quietly and bade Leif follow him. He led him over to the other side of the island, to the mouth of a little cave. "'I live here,' he said in his gentle voice. "'You are the first guest who has paid me a visit, and the only man I have seen for many years.' Assuredly God had his special purpose in sending you hither, my brother, however that may have happened. If you will share my cave with me for the night, you are welcome. In the morning you can swim to the shore, if you will, and are a strong swimmer. You can also perhaps remain here, if you prefer it. What are you doing here? asked Leif, who, to his astonishment, could discover neither the roving eye nor mistrustful behavior of an outlaw in this mild, quiet man. Why do you live alone on this desert island? I serve my God, answered the man gently and seriously, making the sign of the cross. Then Leif suddenly became aware that it was one of the mad Irish monks whom he had before him. From that moment he did not fear the man any more. The monks were peaceful people, mad though they were, but there was something mysterious about the man which caused Leif to feel by no means comfortable in his society. "'How do you live?' Leif asked after a long pause. The man smiled his gentle smile and pointed to a pot-shaped hollow in the rock which stood filled to the brim with sea-water. At high tide God sends me sometimes a little food, he said contentedly, or I dive for shellfish when I am hungry. There is also plenty of seaweed here. I do not need much. Shall not God who feeds the birds also feed me? How do you serve your God? asked Leif, growing curious. I pray, fast, and lead a pure life, answered the monk quietly. Who is your God? Leif questioned further. The one true God, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, answered the monk in his gentle voice, and again made the sign of the cross. What is his name? Leif continued. He had sat down on a stone step outside the mouth of the cave, and fixed his wondering eyes on the monk. He is called Jehovah, his son, whose sacred name is Jesus Christ, let himself be born as man, and shed his blood for men, to wash away their sins. 
Leif was silent. He remembered carved and painted images he had seen, of a god they called Jesus Christ. He hung nailed to a cross, with blood dripping from his hands and feet, from his thorn-crowned head, and from a wound in his side. Leif had always despised this god, who, according to the narrative, had willingly let himself be killed and hung up upon a cross of wood. He did not comprehend the love of such a wretched divinity, which could make a man like this monk live his life on this desert island, merely to pray to him and thank him. A powerless god he must be, much more wretched than even Odin and Thor and yet he could obtain such power over men. The monk had seated himself on a stone directly opposite Leif. The last rays of the sun fell on his back and made his grey hair glow like a golden glory round his head. Leif remembered having seen this gold ring round the head, and he sat and began to feel quite strange and uneasy in his mind. "'Shall I tell you about Jesus Christ?' asked the monk at last, in a voice that was soft and ingratiating like a woman's. No, answered Leif, not without a certain fear in his soul, which distinctly betrayed itself in his voice. Tell me rather of something else. The monk sighed sorrowfully. As you will, my brother. The Lord is mighty, and I am but the least of his instruments. Perhaps he has reserved the grace of delivering your soul for another and worthier than myself. "'What shall I tell you, brother?' "'Tell me something about foreign lands,' said Leif, who had a dim consciousness that there could hardly be anything which this man did not know. "'I cannot tell you about foreign lands,' answered the monk gently. "'I have not seen any other country except Ireland, and I do not feel the want of it. The wickedness of the world is great in the lands. The devil rules most lands where people dwell.' The Lord has of his mercy granted me this lonely island, and my only wish is to live here in peace, till he takes me to himself in his glory. He was silent for a while, and reflected. But I can read to you of a place called Paradise, he said, breaking off his meditations. Then he rose and crept into the low mouth of the cave. A little while after he came back with a roll in his hand. When he opened it, Leif saw that it consisted of some pieces of skin covered over with strange signs. The monk sat down and began to read in a monotonous and devout voice. There is a place that is called Paradise. It is not in heaven, nor upon earth, but between heaven and earth, at an equal distance from both, as it was fixed there by God. Paradise is forty miles higher than the flood rose at its highest. Paradise is of the same length and breadth on all sides. There is no hill nor valley there. There comes never frost, there falls never snow. The earth is luxuriant and fruitful there, but there are no evil beasts, nor dangers, nor defects of any kind. There is a pure well which is called the well of life. There is a splendid and beautiful wood called Radion Saltus, the leaves of which never fade. Each of its trees is straight and round like a spar, and so high that the top is invisible. There are all kinds of trees which stand in complete beauty and bear all manner of blossoms and beautifully colored apples and fruits of all kinds. There no leaves fall from the branches. The wood stands in the midst of paradise. One of the fruit trees was forbidden to Adam. In its fruit was hidden the knowledge of good and evil. There is neither hate nor hunger, and never is there night nor darkness, but always perpetual day. The sun shines there seven times more strongly than in this world, for its light is increased with the light of all the stars. There walk angels, keeping all things in order in joy and pleasure." Thither have the souls of good men gone, and shall go and dwell there till doomsday, since God opened the place when he took thither the soul of the thief who died upon the cross. In paradise there is a bird which is called the phoenix. It is very large and wonderful is the fashion of its creation, and it is the king of all birds. 
it bathes in the well of life, and then flies up on that tree which is the highest in paradise, and sits in the sun. Then it shines with a light like that of the sun's rays. Its whole body gleams like gold, its feathers are like God's angels, its breast is beautiful, and its beak resembles its feathers. Its eyes are like crystal, and its feet like blood. But when this beautiful bird, the phoenix, flies from paradise to the land of Egypt, and dwells there five weeks, all kinds of birds gather there, and sing round it in all manner of ways. Then the men who dwell there hear that, and gather round it from everywhere, and speak as follows, Welcome, Phoenix, to our land. Thou shinest like red gold. Thou art the king of all the birds. Then the people of the land make another phoenix of wax and copper, which resembles the old one as much as possible. All the birds fall at its feet, and honor it with a glad voice. Along its back there runs a red stripe, beautiful as burnt gold. When its fifth week is past, the beautiful phoenix flies again to paradise. All the birds fly with it, some below it, some above it, on both sides. But when they cannot follow it any longer, they return home. The monk paused and looked at Leif, who sat bowed opposite him with open mouth and eyes. When the monk saw how absorbed his hearer was, he smiled and continued, it happened four thousand years before the birth of Christ, one millennium had passed, that the phoenix had become old, and gathered round it a great number of birds, in order to bring together a great pile of fuel. But by God's will it happened, so that the sun shone on the pile of fuel, and the sun's warmth kindled a fire in it. But the phoenix fell in the midst of the fire, and was burned to ashes. But the third day afterwards it rose from the dead, and was young again, and went to the well of life and bathed. Then its feathers grew again, as beautiful as they had ever been. It becomes old in the course of a thousand winters, then it burns itself again to ashes, and rises each time young once more. But no one knows except God alone whether it is a male or a female bird. The monk stopped. The sun had gone down, and the dusk of twilight filled the air. He could no longer see to distinguish the characters. He rolled up his skin scroll carefully together, and tied a band round it. Leif had swallowed his words to the end with eager ears. At the same time the monk's droning way of reading had had a soporific effect upon him. When the monk was silent for a moment, Leif gave a deep yawn, and felt a strange weariness in all his limbs. The next moment he fell asleep where he sat, with his head propped on his hands. The monk let him sit and sleep, while he uttered a long and humble prayer to God, that it might be granted him to save this heathen soul from destruction and the outer darkness. Then he awoke Leif gently, and bade him follow him into the cave, and share his straw bed and his cloak with him, for it was now cold outside. Leif awoke and saw that it was already night, with a pale glimmer of the moon behind black clouds. Now the time had really come, but he was not a little curious to learn more about the monk's cave, and, besides, it was perhaps best to let him fall asleep before he left the island. The monk struck a light and kindled a shaving. Then he crept into the low mouth of the cave. Leif crept after him, and the first thing he set eyes upon was a magnificent sword with a golden hilt and gold inlaid blade. It stood set up against the wall in the innermost part of the cave. It was the most beautiful sight which at the moment could meet Leif's eyes, and it was impossible for him to avert his gaze from the shining sword. When he noticed the monk's look fixed on him, he compelled himself to ask, in an indifferent tone, how it was he possessed such a valuable sword, as he was so poor and peaceful. "'That sword I inherited from my father,' answered the monk gently, and as it were, apologetically. "'I brought it with me here so that it should not do more harm than it has already done among men. I first intended to throw it into the sea.' but it is so splendid. I have never been able to bring myself to do that, and it does no harm here in my cave. 
He took it in his hand with obvious tenderness, and showed it to Leif. Leif dared not touch it, for fear of betraying his covetousness. The monk stood and contemplated the sword, and said, as though reflecting, "'They who slay with the sword shall perish with the sword.' Leif believed that he was pronouncing a spell which belonged to the sword and smiled incredulously. Immediately afterwards he threw himself down on the pallet of straw, as though he were weary and sleepy, and only thought of rest. The monk replaced the sword, put out the light, laid himself down at Leif's side, and arranged his cloak over them both, so that his guest had a brother's share. Leif lay wide awake, wondering whether he should succeed in finding his men, and whether he should see his ships again. Soon afterwards Leif heard the monk snoring, and began to twist and turn himself, to see if that would wake him. No, the monk slept deeply and soundly, his snoring filled the cave with the peace of sleep and night. Then Leif rose stealthily from the pallet, groped his way to the sword, took hold of it, although with a little prick in his conscience, and crept on all fours noiselessly out of the cave, followed by the unconscious snoring of the monk. When he stood outside in the dark night, he raised himself erect and breathed freely. He was not at all sure whether he still had his ships and men, or whether all his men were killed and the ships taken possession of by the enemy. But he again held a sword in his hand, Leif only stopped for a moment outside the mouth of the cave. Then, with long, noiseless strides, he crossed over the island and plunged into the water. He held the sword between his teeth and swam as best he could. Leif found his cloak and other articles of clothing where he had left them. He had much feared lest they should be gone, and the discovery of them have served as a guide to the enemy. He put his clothes on, and then began to listen intently in all directions. When he could not hear any movement or noise anywhere, he set off running along the shore, in the direction of the creek where he had left his ships. The last part of the way he crept through the wood. He reached the creek without having come across hindrances of any kind, and out there lay his ships. They were lying farther out than when he had left them, and to Leif it seemed a good sign. This time he tied his cloak in a bundle on his back, took the sword between his teeth, and thus equipped, swam out to the ships. He swam as noiselessly and cautiously as possible, so that he might be able to turn quickly, if it should prove that it was not his men who were in possession of the ships. When he got within a bowshot of the ships, his old headman gave the alarm and asked in a grim voice, who goes there? Leif answered with a low whistle, which they all knew, and there was great excitement and gladness on board. He had a rope thrown to him. Immediately afterwards he swung himself over the gunwale, and stood wet and dripping among his men, with a strange sword between his teeth. Leif! Leif! they shouted, and all wanted to touch him. Leif asked hastily how many men they had lost. It appeared that they had only three killed and two wounded. The rest had got on board safe and sound. Questions hailed down upon him. His men had really not expected to see him again, and were frenzied with delight and impatient to hear what had happened to him. Before Leif would tell them anything, he questioned them thoroughly, and learnt that they had intended to remain lying here for some days, if the weather allowed, in case he should return, or hoping at least that they might learn something of his fate in some other way. All the men on board the dragon ship were gathered in a cluster round Leif, their eyes fixed on his splendid sword. Leif took off his wet clothes and put on dry ones. Then he crept into his bearskin bag and shook himself with a sense of satisfaction. The men took their places round him and waited patiently to hear his story. Lying stretched on his back among his sitting men, with the pale moonlight flickering over his face, Leif began his narrative. He began with his fall down the ravine. He told them how he had first hooked himself firm with his axe, and then had been obliged to let go of it, and to drop when the men had begun to prick him. He told of his awaking without a weapon, and of his flight. 
he only related briefly the adventure with the flat stone under which he had concealed himself his men listened breathless with excitement when leaf was about to tell of his visit to the cave he suddenly paused he noticed to his surprise that he really did not like to tell how he had got possession of his sword but it was precisely about the sword that his men were most curious to hear the sword asked the old headman in a husky voice when he had been silent for a while yes now comes the most wonderful thing of all answered leaf reflectively and staring at the pale sickle of the moon he rallied all his inventive powers and continued i had at last come up out of the ravine and was wandering in the wood i do not know how long i ran about without an idea where i was but suddenly i stood at the entrance of a great cave in the earth i slipped into it in order to let the darkness hide me when i had gone a good way in i heard a strange sound farther on in the cave i stole forward and caught sight in the dark of a man who sat and sang his head waggled forward and backward and to the sides and his song penetrated my bones and marrow his eyes rolled about in his head as though he were possessed his face was yellow and blue and there issued a strong odor from him for he was not a living man but a dead one a little behind him hung this sword and it shone on the wall of the cave as i was weaponless my life depended on my getting hold of the sword i stole therefore farther on and succeeded in slipping past him without his noticing me but just as i was going to seize the sword i stumbled over a stone on the floor of the cave and at the same instant i had the dead man on me leaf was so absorbed in his story that a cold sweat burst out on his forehead at the narrative of this imaginary fight his men listened in death-like silence staring at him with wide open eyes and pressing involuntarily closer to each other so near to the dead i have never been leaf continued and took a deep breath you have no idea what power there is in a dead man's bones he crushed me as though with claws of iron the most uncomfortable part was that whenever i seized hold of him the flesh slipped away under my grip and i held the bare bone pipes with my hands and there was a most intolerable smell which nearly suffocated me moreover the whole time he kept wheezing foam into my face leaf stopped with a groan and with the back of his hand wiped the sweat from his brow he lay there white as a corpse with burning eyes in the pale moonlight at last i succeeded in getting him under me he said in a lowered voice and putting out my utmost strength i pushed him against the stone he had sat upon and at last i broke his back while he lay there and before i had seized the sword to cut off his wretched head his rotten tongue continued to spit out curses i will not repeat them for they were terrible only so much i will tell you that he said that there was a spell on this sword that whosoever should kill with it should die with it leaf's old headman who during the last part of this narrative had panted like a sick man suddenly sprang up in great excitement throw the cursed sword overboard he shouted in a shaky voice with his whole body trembling leaf reached after the sword and clutched its golden hilt firmly no he answered decidedly i have risked too much to gain it the old man broke down with a hiccuping sob which sent an ice-cold shudder through the bones and marrow of leaf and all the rest what did you do then with the dead man asked one at length with his teeth chattering i cut his head off and laid it by his feet leaf answered curtly and gave a sigh of relief since there was no more to tell leaf remained lying silent his men continued sitting silent and motionless round him leaf found himself wondering that his meeting with the monk had suddenly become so distant and unreal was it not something which he had dreamt how was it really had he not been fighting with a dead man his body was so strangely stiff and if not why should he have this smell in his nostrils leaf no longer knew himself what to believe 
the drowsiness of sleep slurred the clearness of his thought and confused the real with the unreal the old man had gradually become silent for a while he sat motionless with his head wrapped in a corner of his cloak then he let the corner fall and continued to sit and look at leaf when at last he spoke his voice had resumed its deep quiet tone in memory of your wonderful experience and great adventure, you shall hereafter be called Hior Leaf, he said solemnly to Leaf. Leaf smiled with half-closed eyes. Then they closed quite. He slept peacefully and calmly, as though he had never been engaged in fighting a dead man. His men remained sitting quite silent around him. They did not talk together. They had conceived a great fear in their souls, which the moon's unearthly light considerably increased. They were simply afraid to lie down and close their eyes and fall asleep. They could not understand how Leif could lie there and sleep so comfortably after such an adventure. Their admiration for him had never been greater than now. They would like to know whether he would be afraid to encounter the gods themselves, they had never seen fear in his eyes. It was certainly right that he should have the sword affixed to his name and be called Hior Leif. Leif awoke of his own accord at sunrise. Then he saw his men still in a circle round him. He broke into a loud fit of laughter when he saw their stupid eyes and faces weary with watching. Beer, beer, he shouted and sprang up. Plenty of beer for all the men. "'Drink now, boys!' He cheered them up. The most slack of them he whirled round and capsized and thumped till there was a roar of merriment around him. When Leif had emptied a couple of jugs of beer, he felt hungry and demanded food. For a whole day and night he had had nothing except two raw shellfish, if that were not something which he had only dreamt. At any rate, his hunger was keen and insatiable." With continually increasing wonder, his men stood round him and watched him devour a hearty meal. He was the only one on board who had an appetite. An icy dread instilled by the moonlight still possessed his men like bodily nausea. Even the beer which he had given them they drank more from obedience than from pleasure. When Leif had made them first stir themselves and then totter a little on their legs, he set them at the oars and bade them set to work like the boys they were. They should only think of their wives and dearest ones, and for the rest row as though a dead man were after them. Leif had had enough adventures for the present. Now he wanted to get home to Norway. End of Book 3 Chapter 4Book Three, Chapter Five of the Sworn Brothers: A Tale of the Early Days of Iceland, by Gunnar Gunnarsson, translation by Claude Field and W. M. A. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. Helga, the faithful and anxious, was once more to see the summer die on the fields and in the wood, and Leif return home over the autumn sea. The foggy, raw, cold autumn day became great and festive when she caught sight of Leif's ship out on the fjord. A red flag waved from the mast, a signal which had been agreed upon. There came Leif sailing with her happiness on board. Merely the fact of his being alive was like a boon from the gods. It filled her soul with summer to feel herself warm and living in his arms. Every time that Leif came home from an expedition, it was equally new and incomprehensible that he lived, lived and was near her again. Leif came home with spring and renewal of life in his soul. That was always the case with him. The evil and dangerous unrest was gone. He had swept it out of his soul with adventures. Leif was again Leif. His cheerful laughter betokened his inner quiet. There was noise and bustle wherever he moved, but there was a contented assurance in his voice and look. To Helga, at any rate, it seemed worth while to have endured the pain of longing and anxiety during the summer in order to have him home again. 
the eager tone of his voice alone when he asked questions or related incidents made her heart swell with happiness she could forget both to answer and to listen and just cast herself on his neck because she must because it was so delightful to weep and laugh out her happiness with his arms round her leif never returned empty-handed from an expedition besides the serfs and goods which he had this time gained he had acquired a new name hior leif Ingolf, Helvig, and Helga were all obliged to laugh loudly the first time they heard him called by this new name. Leif began at once to explain eagerly, and with a little embarrassment, that it was not a name which he had himself assumed. One of his men had bestowed it on him of his own accord. But it was plain to see that he was proud of the addition to his name, and did not like their laughing at it. They questioned him with curiosity about the sword which had given occasion for the name, a valuable sword which few remembered to have seen the like of. Leif answered with great seriousness that there was a ludicrous story connected with that sword. He had told it once to his men. But it was not a story one went spreading about. He had no intention of repeating it. His old headman, on the other hand, was fond of relating it. He was by no means disposed to let Leif's adventure pass into oblivion, and he related it in such a way that one did not sleep quietly for several nights after hearing the old man's quavering voice relate the unheard of terrors which Leif had experienced in the cave. He certainly deserved to be called he or Leif, especially since he himself liked it, on that all were agreed when they had heard of the way in which leif had gained his sword and so from that day he was called hior leif and nothing else neither ingolf nor any one else doubted that the story was true the sword in itself was sufficient proof moreover it was so entirely like leif not to be satisfied with fighting living men but also to have to test his strength with the dead and to come well out of the encounter. Hior Leif was, as we have said, not to be persuaded to narrate the story himself. He was not at all fond of being reminded of it. His other adventures, small and great, he was generally willing enough to relate, and he took them by no means seriously. His description of the way he hung out over the cliff, clinging to the handle of his axe, and being thrust at by sharp spear-points, might have made even a dead man writhe with laughter, although in itself there was nothing pleasant in the situation. The leaf who revealed himself behind such experiences, and could relate them in such a light and completely artless way, that was the leaf whom Ingolf loved and could not resist. For a long time after he had heard Hior Leif tell of the little hollow in the flat stone, Ingolf could have a fit of laughter merely by thinking of it. Hior Leif confided to Helga, and Helga alone, a wonderful story regarding which he was not sure whether it was an actual experience or a dream. Upon an island he had swum to, he had met a hermit who from some mysterious characters on some pieces of skin had deciphered a long and wonderful account of a place which was called paradise and a bird he called the phoenix had helga ever heard the name of the place or the bird no helga had not and even though helga in her heart thought that there was no limit to hiorleif's possible experiences she gave it nevertheless as her view that it was very likely a dream hiorleif also thought it might be for part of this story or dream was that the hermit had given him shellfish to eat and that he really had eaten them that could in any case not be the fact, for he cherished the most decided dislike to raw shellfish. That must at least be something he had dreamt. All the same, the story about the monk continued to haunt Yorleaf's mind and disquiet him. For a part of the dream which he had not confided to Helga was that he had stolen his sword from the monk, 
That was a bad dream. When Hjorleif returned home from the Viking expedition of the summer, Ingolf had already sold such of their goods and cattle as could not be stowed on board the two ships. He had also sold his dragon ship. He confided in a quiet voice to his brother that he intended hereafter to lead a perfectly peaceful life. Hjorleif once more remembered his dream of the hermit on the island, and said that he also had had enough of these expeditions. They agreed that Ingolf should purchase from Hjorleif his share in the vessel, and that Hjorleif should then exchange his two ships for a powerful trading ship. Ingolf had, in his journeys, seen one that might suit him. The matter was arranged— and everything was now ready for their departure in the next spring. It was the season when the first winter nights were powdering the earth with frost, and now began a lively and unquiet time for the sworn brothers. Relatives and friends came from near and far to spend some days with them. The whole of this last winter in Dalsfjord there was a festivity and bustle which made them all giddy with hilarity, especially Hjorleif. His irrepressible mood infected Helga. She gave herself away and forgot everything, even her most secret troubles. She forgot everything in the one fact that she just had leaf. They let day be day, and night be night, and merely lived— lived in a state of blissful intoxication, which excluded everything except absorption in the present happiness of their souls. Often, when Helga was falling asleep, she thought, You will not wake in the morning, and smiled happily. Her happiness was so deep that death and life ran into one. There was no pause in the festivities. When there was no feast being held in the house, they and their guests and servants were invited to week-long feasts in other houses. Among their kinsmen and friends there were already at this time many who said that if Ingolf and Hjorleif prospered in the new land, they also would sell their properties in Norway and migrate thither. Norway was no longer what it had been. They knew no longer whether they were free yeomen or King Harold's leaseholders. Lately one of Harold's jarls had murdered Atli Jarl the Slender. Hostin held his right and inheritance by Harold's permission, and there were many situated as he was. Everyone who dared to murmur had forfeited life and land, it would certainly be a good thing to find a free place so far away that Harold's hard arm could not reach. Hjorleif reminded Ingolf that he had long foretold that. There was no need to fear solitude in the new land. Before many years had passed, the whole of the great island would be taken in possession by the best men of Norway. Hjorleif spoke contentedly and undisturbedly about the matter. He was himself, as usual, not aware of any responsibility. Upon Ingolf, the prospects of many following them thither had a different effect. He was quite weighed down with a sense of responsibility and anxiety. Was the land out there in the West so good that he could justify drawing others by his example from their inheritance and the country of their race? And, above all, was it the God's will that he should journey thither? Ingolf arranged a great yuletide sacrificial feast, and now he wished to ascertain the will of the gods. On the first night of the feast he cast lots. Some chips or sticks, dipped in sacrificial blood, were tossed in a cloth, and he read off the characters formed by the positions which the chips assumed towards each other. Far to the left lay a chip by itself, straight up and down, a clear character, an eye. That signified ice, and seemed to mean that he should travel. The next character was even clearer. Some chips had so arranged themselves that they formed the runic character F. That signified cattle, goods, and wealth. There was no fear of making a mistake. Ingolf read off still more characters, but they were all propitious, with the exception of a single death rune. 
Well, one could not escape death by not travelling. That came to each one on the day assigned by the fates. Ingolf was reassured. Winter passed, and the days increased in light and length. Then came a spring day. It was a warm and festal spring which fell in step with winter's mood. The sworn brothers launched their vessel and loaded it with goods and implements, men and cattle. Ingolf had taken the pillars of his high seat on board, together with all the images of the gods from the temple. Leif sat doubled up with laughter and watched Ingolf and his men dragging with solemn intentness the worm-eaten and bedizened pillars of the gods from the temple down to the ship. Was Ingolf then no wiser? Helga awoke from her trance of happiness as she stood with her hand in Hior Leif's and sailed out between some small islands covered with spruce and fir, from whence a strong pine scent was carried towards her by a gentle breeze. Hior Leif felt her hand grow cold in his. He clasped the slender fingers more closely. Had he clasped them too closely? Her little hand began suddenly to tremble in his. He looked into her eyes with a searching and slightly troubled look, but there was nothing the matter. She smiled her quietest and happiest smile at him. He kissed her, made her sit in shelter, and wrapped a skin round her so that she should not feel cold. Soon they were outside the islands. The wind blew stronger and more steadily. Before the bellying sails, the two heavily loaded ships steered over a sea blue with spring. End of Book Three, Chapter Five Book Three, Chapter Six of The Sworn Brothers, A Tale of the Early Days of Iceland, by Gunnar Gunnarsson, translation by Claude Field and W. M. A. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Sworn Brothers' ships lay rolling violently, rocking and pitching in the heavy swell south of Iceland. The day was calm and warm. High light clouds were spread over the deep blue vault of heaven. The sun poured his strong spring light in broad floods over sea and land. That day it was fourteen days since they had sailed out from Dalsfjord. For fourteen days they had been in the power of the wind. A storm which tore the sails and broke the yards had driven them about over a raging sea which ceaselessly sent cold showers of spray over the low gunwales. From morning till evening, from evening till morning, four men had stood in each vessel with the two bailing scoops, working for life to keep the water out. In spite of being continually relieved, the men were at last so worn out and wasted that they could scarcely eat, and fell asleep and rolled over wherever they sat down, even for a moment. By continual watchfulness and clever seamanship, the brothers had succeeded in keeping their vessels together. Each stood day and night at the rudder. Only in the short intervals, when the wind turned, or there was a short pause, did they throw themselves down to sleep for the moment as if dead. They had no time to think of Helga and Halvig. Helga was careful not to be in the way. She rendered the small service she was able to do, under these circumstances, as much as possible, without making herself observed. Halvig sat with her boy in her lap, and let the wind blow and the storm rage. She kept her eyes on Ingolf and felt safe. The sworn brothers fought for life and death with storm and sea. The great thing was to hold out, not to give up, not to think of anything but what concerned the steering and the quantity of canvas they should carry, not to be wearied, not to lose one's head, to hold out, to hold out. It was just this unceasing struggle which kept up their courage and spirits. The animals were ill and starving. Some of them died and had to be thrown overboard. Others lay in their last agonies, pitiable to see. Much of their corn and other food stores were spoilt by the dense showers of spray. 
the fresh water in the casks sank regularly and irremediably. The men went about slackly and had to be kept going with a hard hand. There was hardly anything on board which was not otherwise than it should be, and giving reason for deep anxiety. But the brothers held out. When at last on the previous day they had seen on the extreme verge of the northern horizon a light from the snow-covered interior of the new land like a faint white gleam, each had thought within himself that it was not a day too soon. During the last twenty-four hours the storm had at last slowly quieted down, and now they lay here, held up by a presumably only short calm, a few hours' sail from the coast, and gazed curiously and expectantly over the sea at the land in the blue distance. The ships lay side by side, kept in their places by long boat-hooks, only so far from each other as was necessary in order to prevent their chafing and injuring their sides. Hjorleif and Helga had gone on board in Golf's vessel in order to greet him and Halvig and to talk over the situation. All four were seated, Halvig with her little boy in her arms on the stern poop. After the severe trial they had passed through, there was a silence over them which was difficult to break. They had not yet grown properly accustomed to the fact that life and death did not hang on each moment as it passed. Therefore they spoke but little. Towards the northeast and northwest, the soft lines of the slightly rising and falling glaciers stood out behind the blue mountains that crowned this flat land. The brothers followed the changing contours of the country with a peculiar tenderness in their eyes, but their gaze always turned back to the glaciers which shone sparkling white in the strong sunshine. Halvig and Helga also could not turn their eyes away from the glaciers. The few words which they now and then exchanged were said in low tones as if they sat in a temple and not at sea on a swaying vessel. Ingolf and Hjorleif had long sat silent side by side, inspecting the land with keen eyes. Between a projecting point a long way to the east and another far to the west, there stretched a flat, unbroken coastline, distinctly marked by a white edge of rolling surf. It will be difficult to land here, concluded Leif at last, in a slightly hard and irritated tone. Also, it seems as if most of the land nearest the shore is barren sand. There are enough landing places by the points, Ingolf answered quietly and behind the sands the land may be good and fertile even close up to the glaciers we saw that on the eastern side last summer ingolf was in secret rather disappointed that they had not found the svan fjords again but he did not speak about it it was not possible to look for them now at present the great thing was to get on land as quickly as possible, and almost anywhere, so that the men and animals could have a good rest and recover. The sworn brothers had agreed that they must settle for the summer and the coming winter on the spot where they landed. Afterwards they might look out for a permanent residence. Ingolf had very decided views with regard to the choice of a dwelling-place. These views, however, he had not yet confided to Hjorleif, nor to anyone else. The matter concerned the gods, and in all that concerned them his brother's attitude was a foregone conclusion. Hjorleif, on his part, only thought of finding a pleasant and fertile spot, preferably by the sea, and protected by the mountains, where he could feel himself at home and be comfortable. For a long time they sat in silence, each deep in thought. Ingolf reflected how he had best communicate his plan to Hjorleif. He saw at once that it was no good to be silent about it longer. For already, before they departed from here, it must be put into execution. He sat and felt rather perplexed inwardly, and could not find words. At that moment Hjorleif was sitting and reflecting over an experience which he had had the previous night. He had lain asleep in his bearskin bag while his old headman took charge of the tiller. Suddenly he started up from sleep, having certainly dreamt of something or other he could not remember, 
and as he did so he collided with a man who must have been stooping over him. It was one of his Irish serfs, Duftak, a man whose evil eye had followed him since he once in wrath had stretched him on the ground with a well-deserved blow. Your leaf was not certain, but it seemed to him that the serf had thrown something or other which he had in his hand overboard, just as he had stumbled against him and stood opposite him. He thought he had heard a little splash, as when a hard object strikes the water. But he was by no means certain of the matter, and neither the serf's eyes nor his behavior had betrayed anything. He had asked him what he was doing here, and it seemed that he had come to look after a roll of rope which lay close by. He or Leif had had his thoughts occupied the whole day by this occurrence. He had already observed for a long time that the serf's eyes followed Helga wherever she went and stood, with an evil and at the same time covetous look. He could not understand why he had not already thrown the serf overboard, and why he did not intend to do so. He was quite sure that it was not from fear, although there seemed to be a peculiar understanding among his Irish serfs. It was rather because he could not do without serfs, and because if he killed one of them it would be safest to kill them all. At length Leif unwillingly shook these thoughts off, and asked curtly, we shall sail southward, I suppose, when the wind gets up again. Ingolf was silent. It was certainly about an equal distance to the two points, and he had a very great desire to seek a landing place near the more easterly of the two. Instead of giving a direct answer, he began cautiously, I have thought, brother, that I, for my part, will let the gods decide where I should settle in this new land. Leif, whose temper at the moment was a little off its balance because of the incident with the serf, gave a hard laugh. How will you go about it? Ingolf pointed to the pillars of his high seat, which lay lashed together with strong skin straps above a pile amidships. I will throw the pillars of my high seat overboard. Wherever they drift to land, I will settle. Even if they drift to land in the middle of the sands here? asked Hjorleif incredulously and a little scornfully. The gods will know how to find the place where it will be best for me and my family to settle, answered Ingolf undisturbed. I lay with confidence the choice of a dwelling in their hand. Hjorleif was silent for a long time. There was a hard and pitiless line round his large mouth. There was Ingolf again with his cursed gods. At last he spoke without looking at anything. Instead, then, of our choosing a place for ourselves where the earth is fertile and luxuriant, we are to settle wherever it pleases the wind and current to wash up a pair of dead planks on shore. He talked himself into a bad temper, and he wound up bitterly. We shall hardly be neighbors then, brother. Ingolf sprang up from his place. He was on the point of giving an angry answer when he remembered suddenly a snowy day when he and Hjorleif had ridden alone over a desolate heath. He shut his lips tightly and stood for a while silent, leaning against the tiller. In his eyes there was a seeking look which wandered in perplexity over the water. The sun's glimmer dazzled his eyes. He could not find a word kind and cautious enough to answer with but his resolve stood immovably firm. Suddenly he collected himself, and calling a couple of his men, bade them take the high seat pillars down from the pile and lay them on the gunwale. So he stood for a while and let his hands glide carefully over the age-browned wood. Your leaf sat watching with a hard, evil look in his gray eyes. Cautiously Ingolf let the pillars glide overboard. He remained standing, and followed them with his eyes as they lay there floating on the bright, oily water. He or Leif could only see his back. There was an air of decision and resolve about that back, which irritated him still further. Halvig and Helga had followed the conversation, and now sat silent and anxious, not daring to look at each other. Helga did not at all reflect which of the two was more in the right— she was simply troubled. 
in her gentle mind there rose a strange impotent fear which made her heart beat heavily and painfully Halvig, on the other hand, was at first, in her inmost heart, on the point of justifying Hiorleif. At the first moment it appeared to her that one's own eyes, choice of a dwelling, could always be as good as that of blind gods, nay, really much safer. But when she had sat for a while with her firm open gaze fixed on Ingolf's back, a change took place in her mind. The air of security and assurance, which was about her husband's whole person, and which his back just now so distinctly expressed, had an unconscious effect upon her. She understood all of a sudden that it was just this sign from the gods which was needed in order to attach her husband's heart firmly and unbreakably to his new home. There, where the pillars of his high seat drifted on shore, Ingolf would feel himself at home with all his soul, and in spite of reason. The God's choice of the place would give his strength and will the firm ground without which, in spite of all his strength, he could not thrive. On a spot so chosen, Ingolf would force happiness and prosperity to dwell in the face of every imaginable difficulty— for in alliance with his gods he was invincible. Halveig sat there and became assured and peaceful in mind. She understood that it was from an unwaveringly sure and wise instinct that Ingolf acted when he cast the pillars overboard. It was of vital importance to him to feel himself in covenant with his gods and in possession of their favor. Halvig stooped over her little boy and kissed him on the forehead, and remained sitting for a while with bowed head, lest any should see she had tears in her eyes. With beating heart Ingolf stood and watched his treasured pillars tossed by the billows, lightly, aimlessly, as though they were ordinary pieces of driftwood. It was not without severe internal conflicts that he had resolved to deliver his dearest possession to the power of the sea— but here life was at stake. It was not only a matter of finding a place where his cattle could graze and his house stand, but of finding exactly that place which the gods willed to grant him and his family, the place where they could know he would stay for the future, the place where his and his family's happiness and prosperity were not only under his but under their care and responsibility. When Ingolf had stood for a long time watching the pillars, which gradually drifted astern in an easterly direction, his displeasure towards his brother disappeared. He turned slowly, and with a peculiar smile upon his young face towards the others, went quietly and seated himself by the side of Hjorleif. "'What do you think of our choosing the eastern point as a landing-place, brother?' he asked in a quiet and friendly tone." The question irritated Leif. There was no talk of choice. It was merely a question where a piece of driftwood should decide their landing. "'I have already for my part chosen the West,' he answered firmly, and at the same time as quietly as he could, and not without a certain satisfaction at the effect of his words. But it was not only on Ingolf that Leif's answer had the effect of a well-directed blow— both Halvig and Helga felt that here was something evil and dangerous going on. Quite involuntarily, Helga called Hjorleif's name in a supplicating tone. She had no idea of wishing to influence him in the least degree. She knew him and was aware that it was hopeless. The word fell like a prayer from her gentle and anxious soul. In one hot wave the blood mounted to Hjorleif's head when he heard Helga's voice. You can remain with your brother, since you prefer that to following me. The bitter words leapt from his mouth. Helga broke down in a heavy and despairing fit of weeping. Leif sat motionless and apparently unmoved. But in his breast there tore and tugged a fierce and intolerable pain, which was not far from making him powerless. It was not at all, as it now appeared, a sudden whim which caused him not to wish to have Helga on board again. It was the scene by night with the surf Duftak, which from the beginning had given rise to the thought in him that Helga would be really safer on Ingolf's ship. 
some vague and groundless presentiment or other which made him still more sensitive and impatient told him that there was danger in the journey for him and helga it was nothing but pure tenderness for helga which made him resolve that they should part before they were all quite on shore this time he had not thought of parting from ingolf but in a moment your leaf was completely in the power of his restless temperament which as so often before distorted his words and actions and drove him to hasty resolves to separate from the others and seek another landing-place with the prospect perhaps of not seeing them for a whole year was for him a much greater trial than for ingolf to whose equable temperament a year's separation contained nothing unthinkable or alarming he or leaf could really not imagine how he could hold out merely a month much less a whole year without them and if he now chose to land in another place than ingolf each for the present would have to remain where he landed but it was completely impossible for him to expose his dependence and pain at parting he could neither humble himself nor subdue his spirit so far as to enable them to discuss matters reasonably as soon as the fateful words were out of his mouth he was helplessly in their power while thoughts and feelings were rushing like violent streams through Heorleaf's lacerated soul, Ingolf had already succeeded in reviewing the matter reasonably. In separation there was the advantage that the one who first found a landing place could, by kindling a fire on his point, inform the other, who perhaps would be seeking a landing place in vain where he could look for one ingolf with a seaman's practised eye had long before discovered that the coast here was difficult not to say impossible to land on it confronted the open sea the heavy swells which were certainly almost always prevalent here would shatter any ship that tried to land on the sands it was by no means unlikely that the character of the coast near the two points might be equally difficult and it was impossible to know if the coast east or south of the points was better. Since Leif now wished it, Ingolf had for his part nothing against their separation, for some days or for a year, as it might happen. He therefore quietly proposed that whoever first succeeded in landing should kindle a fire on his point as a signal to the other. The latter could then make for that place if he had not found another harbour before, or, in the contrary case, might answer with a fire on his point. He or Leif briefly agreed to this arrangement. It was he who had settled that they should separate, and yet it was a severe disappointment to him that it was now finally decided on. "'I may come southward in the spring,' if i have not by that time found my pillars said ingolf quietly when the matter of the fires had been settled but if i should not come i will send you a messenger if i have not heard from you before he or leaf nodded curtly it was incomprehensible to him that ingolf could sit there and talk so quietly as if nothing had happened between them and everything was all right if you find my pillars ingolf continued with the same immovable calm take good care of them and let me know of the discovery as soon as possible he or leaf made no answer internally he swore that if he had the luck to find the infernal pillars it would be a joy to him to let the fire devour them all conversation gradually died out among the four persons who sat there, swinging on the sea, swayed by the balance of fate, each mind filled with its characteristic inner thoughts, peace or unrest, wearing pain or assured contentment, sat there in the grip of their own souls and of blind powers, while the brilliant spring day glided into a light soft night. The red sun-gold over the sea in the west faded and died away into other and colder colors. The world was new and strange, and charged with presentiment as always on the boundary between day and night. The four sat there, and let the day go, and night come over their peaceful or irritated silence. Ingolf's little boy Thorsten slept quietly in his mother's bosom. 
all around was quiet. Peace was there for whomsoever had a mind to receive it. The brothers sat side by side, yet each in his own world. Ingolf, as always, kept his mind collected, was his natural self, and knew it. Just as he ate what nourished his body of the good things of sea and earth, so his mind absorbed whatever benefited him from the changing moods of day and night, sea and heaven and earth. Everything else remained lying untouched and harmless outside the tightly closed circle of his mind. With your leaf it was otherwise. He had no collectedness in his mind. Every kind of experience or mood which approached him was seized by the tentacles of his restless heart. Evil and good, health and injury, his hungry nature swallowed and satiated itself with all, without any other result than merely to increase his burning desire for something, a condition or an experience, he knew no name for it. In a measure he was himself, just as in golf was, but his self was volatile and difficult to grasp. It died away in grief and gladness, as though it were a part of them. Thus the night passed, and when day again bordered the east, it was followed by a gentle breeze from the sea, which could be used for sailing equally westward or eastward. Hiorleaf rose and heaved a heavy sigh in the cool morning air. His last hope, a stiff breeze from the west, which would oblige him to follow his brother, was gone. Helga and Ingolf both rose with Hiorleaf. Helga went to him, put her arm round his neck, and pressed close to him. No prayer came from her lips, but her whole soul was a prayer. He or Leif examined his mind and found a fear there, some misty foreboding of impending disaster, which determined him to stand firm, to be hard both towards himself and towards her. He responded to her caress, but not in the whole-hearted way which would allow him to forget his words and revoke his determination not to let her follow him. There was a distinct air of separation in his kiss and in the gentle passing of his hand over her luxuriant fair hair. So Helga gave up her hope and submitted silently to his will, as she had always done. He or Leif silently gave Halveg his hand in farewell. She looked firmly and inquiringly at him, and pressed his hand silently. There was something about your leaf, the man who was so unlike Ingolf, and whom she did not understand, that stirred something in her heart. When he had left her, she suddenly called after him, "'Good-bye, your leaf, till we meet again. We shall take good care of Helga.' Your leaf turned towards her with a forced and wry smile on his irregular features, a smile which betrayed such a pathetic and involuntary gratitude that, immediately after he had turned and gone, Helga fell into Helvig's arms and both wept. They had suddenly divined with the sure instinct of women that it was out of tenderness and love that your leaf had let Helga remain behind. There was much in the whole sudden arrangement which they did not understand, but this they did. Ingolf followed your leaf to the gunwale amidships. The men were engaged in drawing the ships close together with boat hooks. The distance between them had gradually become so small that he could soon spring over into his own ship. I do not rightly understand why you let Helga remain behind, Ingolf said at last, when Hiorleif already had his foot on the gunwale. Hiorleif paused and stood still a little, without meeting Ingolf's searching look. I cannot give you any reason, he answered at last, and the hardness and gruffness in his voice spoke of feelings of quite another sort in his heart, except that in my judgment it is the best for her. Ingolf's whole bearing clearly showed that the answer did not satisfy him. Hiorleif became irritated. I have ten serfs and only ten freemen, he continued, in a firm and rather annoyed tone, for he did not like, not only before Ingolf, but also before himself, to clothe his forebodings in such a distinct shape. I cannot always be at hand, and the serfs are not reliable. I may fall sick, and misfortune come upon us. Many things may happen. Are you satisfied? 
your leaf's tone was still equally hard and unyielding but ingolf had seen through him and smilingly reached him his hand Hiorleaf squeezed it with his iron claw so that it hurt, and stood meanwhile with averted face, his features worked visibly, and he bit his lip till the blood came. Hastily he let go of Ingolf's hand, and at the same moment sprang into his own ship. Immediately afterwards Ingolf heard his voice from it. It was cuttingly sharp, and rose higher and higher in a torrent of words. It soon appeared that Hjorleif had quickly succeeded in putting life into his men. Soon after, his ship, with sail hoisted, glided away before the light breeze. Ingolf stood and thought that such a lonely year might do Hjorleif good. He would be a different man the next time they saw him. Ingolf only lent a momentary hearing to the voice of a strange, wounded, and groundless sense of loss in his soul. Quietly he turned round, roused his tired men mildly, and bade them hoist sail and make the vessel clear. As early as the next night, Hiorleif saw a fire shine from Ingolf's point. So Ingolf was already on land, and everything was right there. Hiorleif had not fared so well. The westerly breeze he had so strongly desired had come when he had no more use for it. It had come too late, and very inopportunely. After forty-eight hours he lay here pitching in the choppy seas, tacking as well as he could, without getting much nearer his object. There was not a drop of fresh water on board. The Irish serfs had discovered how to knead meal and butter into a mess they called mintak, and declared that it was a food one did not get thirsty by eating. None the less, all were suffering with thirst, and the animals were in a miserable condition, unable to swallow a straw of the hay they had brought with them. The mintak quickly fermented, and the whole mass had to be thrown overboard. It was only Hior Leaf's wretched and indomitable obstinacy which prevented him from taking advantage of the wind and quickly running his ship to Ingolf's point. By doing so, all his sufferings would have been got rid of at once. It needed only a little resolution, a slight change of mind. The wind was there, the light was there. The fire gleamed and beckoned, all was well so far. The only difficulty was that the deciding little possibility was wanting, the possibility of your leaf's bending his mind the little bit that was necessary, the possibility of giving way. In Hjorleif's volatile soul there towered a steep rock. He would see his animals perish of hunger and thirst, his crew perish one by one, and himself die by any death whatever, rather than turn his vessel and use the favorable wind. At last, on the evening of the third day, a little rain fell, and Hjorleif succeeded in collecting some water in the outspread sail. That refreshed both men and animals. Not till four days after Ingolf had kindled his fire did he see a fire burning in answer on Hjorleif's point. When he told Helga that, she went up on the point, sat by herself and stared fixedly at the faint red light, sometimes hardly visible far to the southwest. There she remained sitting for two days and nights, as long as Hjorleif kept up his fire, in order to be sure that it should be seen. Ingolf and Halvik had at last begun to be anxious for Helga, for she ate nothing, did not sleep, and hardly answered when they spoke to her. But when, after these two days spent up there on the point, she returned to the tents, she was herself again, and had recovered her old self-command. There was nothing to show either Ingolf or Halvig that she carried about a burning sense of bereavement. Neither did they know that she lay whole and half nights sleepless, breathing in fancy the rich, delicious scent of pine trees. End of Book Three, Chapter Six. Book Three, Chapter Seven of the Sworn Brothers: A Tale of the Early Days of Iceland by Gunnar Gunnarsson. Translation by Claude Field and W. M. A. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. For the second time in his life, Hior Leaf lost his spirits completely. 
after closer reflection he found his lonely situation so meaningless and unjust so devoid of all reconciling elements such as for example a prospect of adventures or opportunity for exploits in brief so utterly irrational that he involuntarily began to show his teeth at existence by drowning himself in perpetual melancholy only now and then interrupted by isolated attacks of ill temper the days encountered him heavily and sulkily it seemed as if all their endeavors were directed to show him in earnest how empty and tedious and intolerable they could be if they seriously set about it the bright cloudless summer days sneered at him when they met him with ice-cold scornful light from sunrise to sunset gray and rainy days on the other hand showed him without disguise their dull side he or leaf could not come to an agreement with himself which of the two kinds of days was really the more intolerable they were all alike impossible the one point he was clear about with regard to the days was that he had without doubt still the worst remaining he cursed them with oaths which were powerful both in length and strength and derived from an inexhaustible supply but they were no help not even momentarily in the battle with the days he suffered one defeat after another they were far stronger than he they were invincible and they possessed although he daily experienced that in spite of all they did pass a peculiarity of appearing endless which deprived him of all hope he or leaf tried in every way to put a little meaning into them he set his freemen to build a winter dwelling a house nineteen fathoms long it was to contain them all, together with their wives. He had only taken young, newly married people with him from Norway, with the single exception of his old headman. He or Leif did what he could to take a little interest in the work, but it was only self-deception. The days did not for a moment let go their wild beast clutch on his neck. He set the serfs to build a house eighteen fathoms long, and bullied them till they quailed and shivered, and fell into helpless embarrassment merely at the sight of him. Yes, he instilled a wholesome terror into the Irish serfs. They slunk about, and hardly knew whether to walk upright or on all fours, and they had no eyes, at any rate, there seemed no more any sight in their eyes. Regarding them, he felt sure that he had made them harmless forever, but it brought him no comfort either to treat them like dogs or to realize their harmlessness. That did not bring a spark of his spirits back. There was nothing to rouse them in that quarter. One of the items in Heor Leaf's despairing and hopeless struggle with the days was going along the shore and choosing driftwood for his buildings. When he found a stout, solid plank, he marked it with a stroke of his axe, then he bade the serfs find the plank so marked and bring them home. Sometimes in these wanderings he or Leif found himself standing and hewing wildly and meaninglessly at a plank, as though his life depended on cutting it into a plaything for the winds. Whenever he awoke from such an attack of frenzy, he looked round him with a shamefaced expression, and began eagerly, with a strong sense of humiliation, to efface the traces of it, watched by the evil eye of a hostile day. He or Leif had one hope, and only one. His longing, strongly reinforced by his despair, had treated with the rocky pride of his soul, and the result was a reasonable agreement. Therefore he went everywhere, and searched for Ingolf's high seat pillars, not in order to do away with them by means of fire, but to get an excuse for seeking Ingolf at once, and so obtaining an honorable and acceptable victory over all that pained and plagued him. He or Leif wanted to see what the day would look like, when, by finding the pillars, he was able to escape from his wretchedness with a bound. This hope sustained him but day after day passed without his finding the pillars not even the sea and tides were friendly disposed towards him he talked in a loud voice with the sea and reminded it of all the honourable bouts they had had with each other 
but either the sea did not hear or would not recognize him it had perhaps become hostile towards him like everything else in heaven and earth he or leaf had been as far eastward along the coast as the impassable glacier streams would let him go now he turned westward he took food with him and remained away four days and nights during his expedition he came to know a new part of the country which he liked and where he could well imagine himself settling below the green mountains which first in a steep ascent and then with a more gradual incline rose towards the white glacier which with its two domes reminded one of a female giant's breast the low land stretched with fertile meadows and picturesque bush-covered valleys and luxuriant pastures towards the shining sea in the southwest green precipitous isles rose from the sea he or leaf gave the mountains names after these islands which simultaneously limited and enriched the view and called them island mountains the western dome of the glacier he named the island mountains glacier the eastern he had already after a more eastern district baptized Merdal's glacier he or leaf did not turn round for he saw the land open into a wide bay towards the west he examined the shore outside the island mountains and Merdal very closely it was a great disappointment to him that the pillars had not drifted on shore here he or leaf returned home from this excursion still more taciturn and depressed than he had started wearying unrest received him with open arms every morning and did not release him from its evil embrace till sleep at night had pity on him he set some of his men to get in hay others he made go out fishing the rest he kept occupied with the houses it was an insignificant alleviation of his trouble to see his men busily occupied for himself he had no patience for anything on the walks which he now and then took along the coast to assure himself if the pillars had not drifted on shore in his immediate neighbourhood he was no more accompanied by even the smallest hope during these walks helga was always in his mind but not openly and consciously he scarcely had patience enough to think of her in that way no secretly and hidden away she lived in his mind through memories and reminiscences she was near to him without his being obliged to face the fact that they were divided from each other by a long distance and a sea of days and that this separation was due to a stupid and certainly quite groundless foreboding he carried these memories about very tenderly and cautiously without any intention of letting them slip quite out of the fog of unconsciousness as a man dying of thirst sips do he cheated himself into a reminiscent happiness it was a dangerous proceeding for if he woke from the dream his agony flung him on the ground in a passion of tears unworthy of a man and which moreover brought no relief he or leaf became at last weary of the sea and shore he turned his mind against them and made enemies again evil emptiness and helpless melancholy nature's immovable answer to all discontent so he or leaf became hostile to all things round him the echo of his own mind met him everywhere and tortured him as only self-inflicted pain can torture he extended his lonely wanderings to the wide-stretching pastures overgrown with spreading coppice wood which reached from his point right up to the blue mountains but also in this region he soon became homeless his inner want of peace drove all peace around him away when winter came he or leaf sat like a bear in his lair alone with the fire and his half share of the nineteen fathom long house it was uncomfortable near him therefore his men kept together in their end of the house even though no fire burned there they were newly married and felt neither cold nor dull the serf slunk in now and then by twos with fuel for the fire they shivered and came hurriedly away from their task even though he or leaf sat with his head in his hands and did not look at them at all 
Your leaf was poor now. He was so poor that he caught himself longing for the break in the evening's brooding silence, which the serf's coming caused. So poor that in order not to betray his poverty, he showed himself perverse and ungracious towards his old headman, when the latter once overcame his embarrassment and, out of devotion and sympathy, sat with him one evening. Either he was silent with the old man in his own comfortlessness, or he pained him with scornful words and malicious laughter. The old man could not understand how he or Leif had lost all his good temper and indomitable spirits, unless the evil spirits of this strange land had deprived him of them. He could not endure this land, where he or Leif, his favorite, had neither living nor dead foes to fight with. There were plenty of wizards and goblins here, as he had himself experienced. There was an unearthly life in the rocks and heights. But these were creatures without value for a man eager for battle. One could not attack them weapon in hand. The sacred iron could only protect one against them, and keep them out of the house. He or Leif's old headman fought bravely with his fear and discomfort for an obviously bewitched man. But there came an end, and he also gave up he or Leif, and let him sit alone by the fire. For days and nights together the storm and hail beat on the house with howlings and threatening hootings. The winter days were often only an indistinct glimmer, and in the uncanny winter night all evil spirits were loose. He or Leif sat through the long evenings in his bitterness, alone by the fire. And even the fire, his only friend in the wintry emptiness, now showed fits of enmity, and spat out evil smoke which struck his breast like a tearing cough. He or Leif sat most often with his face in his hands. By doing so he, as it were, shut himself into himself, and cheated in a measure the evil powers in him and round him. But there was a danger in thus sitting, hugging his pain. Solitude used the opportunity to whisper words of madness in his ear, and often he or Leif was near forgetting himself and beginning to listen to its alluring, unbridled talk. But then sleep came and saved him, and gave him some hours' forgetfulness, a forgetfulness which, however short it was, armed him for the morrow's encounter with a hostile, desolate, and lonely day. End of Book 3, Chapter 7「Book 3, Chapter 8 of the Sworn Brothers, A Tale of the Early Days of Iceland by Gunnar Gunnarsson, translation by Claude Field and W. M. A. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. Now there is this to be told of Ingolf that when he had found a practicable harbour, and unloaded his ship and drawn it on land, he set his men immediately to work at building winter dwellings for men and animals. He himself rode about on horseback, followed by a young serf, Vifel, who had grown up in his father's house, and whom he valued greatly. He examined the district and took long rides along the shore to look for the pillars of his high seat. He made use of his opportunities and was satisfied. The district suited him in many ways. From his point he commanded a wide view eastward and westward along the coast, the most extensive view he remembered to have seen. Some distance inland, exactly opposite the point, divided from it by luxuriant pasture land, there rose a steep high mountain. On both sides of it the circle of mountains retired, on the southwest side in a wide curve. Behind this mountain rose the glacier, a gigantic pile of ice glittering white in the distance, which sent wrinkled feelers down all the ravines, as if to taste the lowland. Remarkably enough, no cold emanated from this huge mass of ice, on the contrary, it seemed to warm the air, perhaps by attracting all the bad weather and cold to its far summit, which was only seldom visible. 
on both sides of the point there stretched barren sand along the coast intersected by countless glacier streams these sands in some places spread themselves inland till they met the edge of the glacier. But the wide-stretching pasture-land along the mountains, which this barren sand surrounded, was of a peculiarly rich fertility. There was abundance of coppice wood, which in places grew close up to the glacier, and presented a singular appearance. The cattle throve well here, the air was full of warm moisture, and was suitable for grass and cattle and men. Ingolf had to admit that the summer was better and the soil more luxuriant here than in the Svansfjords. At the same time he wished his pillars would drift ashore in the Svansfjords, and in this Halvig was one with him. Secretly he derived not a little hope from the circumstance that the pillars had apparently taken an eastward direction when he saw them drift away from the ship. Who could say? Perhaps it was to the Svanfjords. He did not dare to wish anything in that way. It was for Odin to decide it. And it would be presumptuous of him to wish to instruct or to influence the one-eyed with the ravens but many things pass through one's thoughts which one cannot control. Odin must know that, and would excuse it. Ingolf endured the suspense for two months. Then he prepared for a long expedition with his serf Vifel. Halvig did not like this journey. Both Ingolf and his men had told her so much about the impassable glacier streams. Ingolf, however, quieted her by promising to show all possible caution but he wished to go and look for himself in the Svanfjords. Ingolf and his serf rode over the sand dunes. On each sand hill sat a gull. Full of an injured sense of proprietorship, the birds sat there and followed silently with an inscrutable look these strange animals who brought disturbance into the landscape. These sands were intersected by a countless number of powerful glacier streams, but fortunately the glacier proved passable in that part, so that Ingolf and his companion succeeded in circumventing the rivers in that way. On the evening of the second day they were again stopped by a glacier stream as broad as a fjord, and with a treacherous bottom of fine sand. It traversed the district Ingolf and Leif had penetrated on their expedition southward from the Svanfjords the previous summer. Ingolf tried to circumvent it in the same way as he had the other river. But here the glacier was so full of deep crevasses along and across its course that after many vain attempts he had to give it up. There was nothing for it but to turn round and put off the examination of the coast till the winter had bridged with ice the impassable rivers. The remainder of the summer passed in winter preparations of all kinds, there were plenty of things to take in hand and look after. Ingolf kept an eye on his sister Helga, and showed her great friendliness in his words and behavior. He could not exactly ascertain the real state of her feelings. She was quiet as ever, and all smiles and good humor. She played with the boy, helped Halvig, and there was apparently nothing in the least the matter with her spirits. But Ingolf had now and then, early in the morning, before anyone else was up, surprised her standing staring with a long look towards the distant mountains that showed bluish in the southwest. In that direction lay Hjorleif's point, although so far away that it could not be discerned. It cut Ingolf to the heart to see his sister stand gazing so. Her face was so unusually pale in the mornings, and her blue eyes darker than at other times, as though shadowed by a twilight below them. He had been many times on the point of telling her about the last words he had exchanged with Leif, for he knew that she was not aware of Hjorleif's real reason for letting her remain behind with himself and Halvig, and had no idea what she thought about it. But on further reflection he gave up the thought of telling her every time. Perhaps by doing so he would only cause her unnecessary anxiety and sorrow. 
She would certainly hardly be so quiet as now, if she were seriously anxious for your leaf. Best not to interfere with her thoughts. For his own part, Ingolf was not for an instant afraid of anything happening to your leaf, though he agreed with him that it was best not to expose Helga to the results of any conspiracy among the serfs, which he might well have reason to fear. But Ingolf knew your leaf. Even if his brother had been alone with the ten seditious serfs, he would not have felt anxious for him. Hiorleaf was on the watch, and he had successfully managed worse situations. The winter began with slight frost and much snow. It was past Yuletide before the rivers were frozen. As soon as possible Ingolf equipped Vifel and another of his serfs named Karl, and sent them eastward along the coast with orders to examine closely every creek and every promontory, and not to return till they had inspected both Svanfjords, except in the event of their finding the pillars before. The serfs experienced wretched weather, with snowstorms and intense frost. They remained away for two weeks, and returned hungry and weary. They had examined the coastline as far as north of the Svansfjords, but seen nothing of the pillars anywhere. When they had informed Ingolf, he heaved a deep sigh and gave up the Svanfjords. He allowed the serfs time to rest and recover after their severe experience. Then he ordered them to get ready again. This time he gave them horses and sent them westward along the coast. He enjoined them not to return till they had found Hiorleaf. If they had not found the pillars before they met him, they were to tell Hiorleaf to come westward with his men and cattle as soon as summer was in the air and a sea passage was safe. But spring came this time earlier than it was expected. Already in the night before the surf started, a warm and strong southwest wind began to melt the snows and melt the ice that covered the rivers. The serfs only succeeded in passing the nearest rivers on ice. By the second day they could neither get forward nor backward by reason of furious rivers which carried huge volumes of muddy water and great blocks of ice. But they had to push on, and did so with the horse's help, although they often wasted days in finding a ford, and sometimes had to let themselves be dragged through the water, hanging on to the horse's tails or manes. It was the worst journey that Viffel and Karl had ever been out on, and it was only due to Viffel's endurance and fidelity that they went forward and escaped with their lives. On the way they met men, Irish monks, who here, far inland, had built a temple, with a brazen voice which shook the air. The monks questioned them, and seemed displeased with what they had to narrate. They did not show them much friendliness, but Viffel and Karl were eternally thankful for merely escaping with life from these strange men, who were in covenant with a god the sound of whose voice alone cast them terror-struck to the earth. At last the serfs reached Hiorleaf's point. They had been fourteen days on the journey. They found the houses empty and the place forsaken. They went down to the shore and found the ship. The boats, on the other hand, were gone. Not the slightest sign of life was visible anywhere. End of Book 3, Chapter 8Book Three, Chapter Nine of the Sworn Brothers: A Tale of the Early Days of Iceland, by Gunnar Gunnarsson. Translation by Claude Field and W. M. A. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros. He or Leaf saw the winter come to an end at last. He lay one night and heard the tone of the wind change. He knew the eager and implacable voice of the southeast wind. It did not surprise him then to hear a dripping indoors and out. His heart began to beat a little as he lay there, but he lay still, did not jump from his bed, 
did not run to salute the spring and bid its warm wind take the bad weather from him as in other circumstances he would have done there was not much left of your leaf's strength now he did not awake with the spring generally he was accustomed to avoid the house when spring had first come but this time he remained within sick in mind and without power to shake off the burden of winter and his bereavement he remained sitting indoors while the young year awoke the earth from winter sleep without paying attention to it this was not like your leaf indeed it was so unlike him that his men avoided each other's looks and did not speak about him he got out of his bed each morning with a sigh clothed himself wearily and went slowly and sluggishly out to see how far the spring was advanced and if the weather held if it was bright he went up on the point and looked eastward over the land and over the sea then he went home again dragging his feet like an old man or an invalid and wrapped himself in his solitude and waited it was still too early in the year for ingolf to be coming ingolf and helga he hardly dared to think of her name the very thought scorched and burned his wounded soul that by this separation which he had insisted on he had caused helga fresh grief his own sufferings were indeed bitterly deserved that he had to acknowledge but that did not make them any easier the thought made the wilderness of his soul even more desolate self-caused self-deserved every torturing day every sleep-forsaken night every suffering every whiplash of longing altogether self-caused without reason and to no use that was bad enough to think about but it was worse with helga helga who might have reason to believe that he had left her behind in cold blood and to think that perhaps he looked forward without longing to see her again the thought was so intolerable that at times it seemed as if his head would split and his heart stop beating these and similar thoughts tortured hiorleif but he sat and let the tedious hours pass outside the spring winds raged while he sat within the spring's gladness found no way to his soul his exhausted heart could not welcome the days in its embrace and rejoice at the prospect of soon meeting Helga. He or Leif used every opportunity of bullying the serfs. He heaped on them kicks and blows whenever the fancy took him, and often without cause. He hated these serfs, who crept before him like vermin, so dog-like and abject that they did not dare to show the glances of their eyes his fear of their combining and attacking him and his men had long ago died out of his mind to the last spark and it seemed to him now both ridiculous and incredible that he had ever cherished such a thought these abject animals these crook-backed creatures their fault it was all that he had had to suffer this year and they should pay for it to the end of their wretched days they should pay for it blows they should have blows and kicks he would fill their currish hearts with never appeased fear he would not kill them they should live and suffer in all that concerned the serfs he or leaf was implacable he had succeeded in inspiring them with such terror that there was not a look in their eyes nor speech in their tongue save when they were alone and sure of not being seen or heard as soon as the earth was released from the frost to a spade's depth he or leaf set his serfs to plough a piece of pasture land west of this point they had an ox to draw the plough and now the serfs time had come duftak who had many kicks and cuffs to avenge had hatched a plan the opportunity was ready to hand when Duftak and another serf went off in the morning with ox and plough, he gave the other serfs a signal. They had knives and clubs hidden here and there. Now these were produced and concealed in their rags. The serfs were ready. As soon as Hjorleif's free men had gone into their morning meal, Duftak stabbed the ox with a knife in its neck and set out running home with the other serfs close on his heels. 
Breathlessly, Duftak burst into Hureleaf and stammered, apparently in the greatest terror, A bear! A bear! The serf's fear seemed quite genuine. Hureleaf seized him by the neck, shook him, and quickly learned from him that a bear had come out of the woods and had killed the ox. Everything happened as Duftak had foreseen. Hureleaf let him go, strangely enough without the usual kick, shouted to his men and bade them follow him and look for the bear and scatter themselves well in the thickets so that the beast should not escape then he seized his axe and spear and ran ah this meant something for hureleaf his heart was again in its place and beat gladly and quietly the bear came as though sent by good fortune itself his soul expanded with a great and happy sense of freedom. He sprang like a boy out of doors, and forgot in his haste to take his sword with him. Duftak only hesitated a brief moment, then he seized the sword and ran after Hiorleaf. He had undertaken to tackle him by himself alone, and the sword was better than his short knife. Everything happened as Duftak had calculated— while his men dispersed in the thicket, Hiorleaf ran to the ox. Dovtek had counted on this curiosity in his master. He knew that he must see how the bear had treated the ox before he began the pursuit. Hiorleaf set off in long bounds, light at heart and untroubled. The old love of adventure had awakened in him. He was too much absorbed to notice that the serf was close at his heels. Hiorleaf reached the ox, stopped and started, bent down over it, then slowly raised himself. His thoughts stood still for a moment in surprise. What was this? The ox had been stabbed. Was the story about the bear only a lie? He turned quietly, and as though stupefied, and looked round him. Just opposite him stood Duftak, with Hiorleaf's sword lifted, the point quivered straight in front of his breast. The recollection of the monk's saying flashed through Hiorleaf's mind like a momentary weakness and irresolution. Then, before he knew it, the gold-inlaid blade of the sword flashed, and he collapsed with a chill sensation between his ribs, a strange, not uncomfortable sensation, which, however, was immediately followed by a pang and a loud crash, in which earth and sky disappeared. As Hiorleaf sank, a lightning thought reminded him that Helga was in safety. Ah, Helga was safe. A dim consciousness that he had not suffered in vain settled like a faint smile on his large mouth. The blood poured steaming and gushing out of his neck, and so the world passed from him. Hiorleaf had lived, and life had done with him. He had paid the price of life, as was meat and right. Once more the mistletoe branch had struck down the invulnerable. End of Book 3 Chapter 9book three chapter ten of the sworn brothers a tale of the early days of iceland by gunnar gunnarsson translation by claude field and w m a this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by rita boutros one night towards morning ingolf was awakened by the tramping of horses hoofs he had begun to be anxious lest the serfs who had been away the best part of a month might have perished, and springing out of bed, dressed quickly and threw a cloak over him. Yes, it was Viffel and Karl, home at last. When he came out, they were standing outside in the half-light night, and talking softly together. They had not yet taken the saddles off the horses. Their manner showed clearly that they were the bearers of evil tidings. Both turned their heads when Ingolf opened the door, but remained standing irresolute, and forgot to salute. Ingolf stood still for a moment. Then he went up to them, greeted them quietly, and bade Karl take the saddles off the horses and go and sleep. "'You had better not talk to anyone,' Ingolf concluded, turning to Karl. Then he laid his hand on Viffel's shoulder and led him round behind the house. There they could best stand and talk undisturbed. 
Biffle was so silent that stillness seemed to envelop him like an invisible vapor in the air. When they had come to the back of the house, Ingolf let go of Viffel's shoulder and leaned against the wall of the house. His first heavy foreboding had quickly turned into a dawning certainty, a certainty which all but overpowered him. For a few interminable moments he remained standing there, leaning against the wall and staring to the eastward, where a faint flush on the steel-blue vault of the sky announced the coming of the sun. He avoided looking at Viffel, whose expression and behavior so inexorably revealed what had happened. He shrank from having his last despairing hope annihilated. He must have an interval before he could endure to have his fears, his all but certain foreboding confirmed by the pitiless word. The sun rose and was free of the clouds on the horizon before his mind had slowly reached the point that uncertainty was intolerable to him. He cast a glance at the surf. Viffel stood and wept, silent and motionless. The tears ran in streams over his cheeks and left light streaks behind them. "'What have you to tell?' Ingolf asked at last, with forced quietude. "'Your leaf's death,' stammered the surf with chattering teeth. There was a long pause. Ingolf had bowed his head and stood with closed eyes and compressed lips. He wept. At last, without raising his head or opening his eyes, he gave the serf a sign to continue. Viffel finished weeping and began stammeringly. When we came to the point, we found the house is empty. We saw no one anywhere. We found the ship in its place, down by the shore, but both boats had gone. We began to search the fields and the undergrowth round the point. First we found Hjorleif. He lay in a field near the house, by the side of a piece of ploughed earth. He had been killed by a stab in the breast. We continued searching, and found gradually most of his men, scattered about in the undergrowth, all dead. Some of them had been obviously stabbed from behind. Others had many wounds, which witnessed to a fight having taken place. The serfs and women we saw nowhere. He or Leif had a foreboding of that was the thought that passed through Ingolf's mind when the surf was silent. Ingolf remained standing quite still. His heart hammered and beat, Leaf, Leaf. At last he lifted his head and looked round him with weary eyes. His look had become very desolate. Otherwise there was nothing to notice in him, now that there was no more doubt, and the first strong burst of grief was over. In a quiet voice he questioned the serf more closely, and learned that he and Karl had buried those of Hjorleif's men whom they had found. Hjorleif himself they had covered and left lying where they had found him. A strange slackness had come over Ingolf. Now and then he roused himself and put a question to the serf. Each time the serf had answered, there was again a long pause. Ingolf gradually got an account of their journey. Viffel told him of the difficult rivers, of the monks and their temple, and how he and Karl had caught and killed one of Hjorleif's sheep, which they had found in the thicket as food for their home journey. Helga was up this morning early as usual. She was generally out before anyone else, especially when the weather was bright. It was in the early morning that she could best go out, unseen and undisturbed, to stand and gaze toward the distant mountains in the southwest, which hid your leaf in their blue mist. This morning, as soon as she stepped out of the door, she heard quiet voices behind the house. She could not distinguish words, but only heard the sound. This half-heard conversation filled her at once with a peculiar fear— and when she recognized Biffle's voice, her heart beat violently. A vague alarm filled her breast and rose, choking, to her throat. For some time she remained standing and could not move from the spot, stood leaning heavily against the house wall and pressed her hand to her heart. Then the voices were suddenly silent. There was stillness behind the house. What could Ingolf and Viffle have to talk about in such a tone? Why had Ingolf not roused her at once? 
She knew how restlessly he was expecting the serf's arrival. At last Helga dragged herself the few steps round the house. She both hoped and feared that she must have made a mistake, that it was not Viffel's voice she had heard. But she must have certainty. Her fear was crushing her. Yes, there stood Viffel, and there stood Ingolf. Helga only needed to see them. The first glance told her everything. Ingolf immediately saw his sister, and by a powerful effort succeeded in collecting himself and going quietly towards her. As he went, he said quietly to the serf, "'Go and sleep, Viffel. You are a free man.' Viffel departed silently. He did not take the opportunity to thank Ingolf. His highest hope was at last, and unexpectedly fulfilled, yet he wept as he went." When Ingolf had reached his sister, he stood still in perplexity. There was in her look a mingling of prayer and certainty which made it impossible for him to say anything. There was a restlessness about Helga which made it impossible for her to stand still. "'Let us go,' she said appealingly. Side by side, brother and sister went over the ground without speaking a word. Where the coppice wood began, they turned and went back towards the houses. So they continued walking to and fro silently, side by side. The sun had risen and already stood high. Ingolf's men, who had learnt of Hjorleif's death from Viffel, kept within doors. None wished to disturb Ingolf and Helga. Halvig had been out and glanced towards the pair. Then she had slipped in again to her boy. Helga's grief made her very heavy at heart. To and fro, keeping step, Ingolf and Helga went. Helga felt as if she could not stop. As long as she could walk so, keeping herself in movement, it seemed as if there was nothing which had ceased, ended. So long as she had heard nothing, perhaps nothing had happened. There were life and happiness at stake in continuing to walk, to walk and not stand still. There was no sobbing in Helga's breast. It was so empty within. A clammy pressure held her heart imprisoned in apathy. There were no tears in her eyes. She was far past the narrow limits of weeping. Only a great and threatening stillness and emptiness in her soul, and round her a waste wilderness that would swallow her as soon as she stood still. At last she was so exhausted that she had to drag herself forward with the help of her brother's arm. Ingolf helped her, supported her, and held her up. He was in great distress. She walked there, quivering on his arm, and he had no comfort to give her. Such heavy hours Ingolf had never experienced. He forgot his own sorrow. It was as nothing beside his sister's mute despair. His whole soul was engrossed in her. His powerlessness, his complete perplexity, his lack of any word to comfort her, drove all other feelings out of his mind. At last Helga had to give up. Her strength was spent. Exhausted, she sank in his arms. He laid her carefully down, and she remained lying with half-closed eyes, breathing heavily and slowly. Then she fell asleep. Ingolf remained sitting by her side and gazing intently on her pale, tired face. She continued sighing in her sleep. Ingolf could not take his eyes from her. This was what Lee feared, was the thought that echoed within him. There were not very many thoughts in his brain, stunned as it was by his own and his sister's grief. When he had been sitting thus for some time, Halvik came out to him from the house with her boy on her arm, she could no longer endure the loneliness. She sat down silently by Ingolf's side. Her eyes were circled with red rims, and there was a peculiar wry smile on her face, called forth by the struggle to keep her tears down. When she had sat a little and looked at the sleeping Helga, she could do no more. She leant her head against her husband, hid her face, and wept. Little Thorsten prattled cheerfully and struggled to get down to Helga. Ingolf had to begin to play with him in order to make him sit still. The child's untroubled chatter cut him to the heart. Helga slept but a short time. Suddenly she opened her eyes, rose abruptly, and looked about her in bewilderment. 
"'What is this? Why am I lying here?' she asked in an astonished voice. As soon as she spoke, she felt a choking in her throat, and remembered all of a sudden what had happened, and why she lay there. Then she collapsed with a groan, and remained sitting for a while with her face hidden in her hands. Then she straightened herself abruptly. "'How did it happen?' she asked in a hoarse, uncontrolled voice, and looked straight in front of her, with a hard expression on her young face. And when Ingolf did not answer at once, she added in a still more unrestrained tone, "'Tell me at once!' Ingolf told her, hesitatingly and in disconnected words, that his serfs had found Jorleif and his men dead. It looked as if Jorleif's Irish serfs had killed them. "'But the women?' Helga asked in the same tone as before. Ingolf gave it as his opinion that the serfs must have taken the women with them to whatever hiding they had sought." He added a few cautious words to the effect that he had grounds for supposing that Hjorleif already a year ago had been afraid of what had now happened, and that therefore he had let her remain with him and Halvig. Then Helga laughed, if the sound which issued from her throat could be called laughter. "'It is all the same now,' she said in a hard voice. Then she collected herself and stretched out her hand toward the child. For a while she sat stroking his hair and trying to smile at him. Then suddenly she gave Halvig the boy and looked up at her brother with a look that revealed all her hopeless despair without disguise, and said, I want to see him. Can we not go there? Her voice was hoarse and passionate as before. There was nothing to recall her former soft and gentle tone, but the hardness was gone. We will go as soon as we can, answered Ingolf quietly. Helga rose impatiently. She was a little unsteady on her legs, but declined all support, both from her brother and her sister-in-law. "'Let us not waste time,' she said irritably, and stumbled towards the houses. Ingolf and Halvek followed her in silence. Halvek took the boy on her arm again. That same day the ship was launched. Day and night they worked with feverish haste, too loaded. The next day it lay ready for sea, and in the evening the weather was fair for sailing. Ingolf wondered a little at Helga. She did not weep. She did not seek solitude. She went about among them much as usual, did her accustomed work, took charge of the boy, and helped Halvig. Only the change in her voice and her strange fixed look betrayed her grief, a grief which made Ingolf fear, and troubled him more than any weeping and open despair. End of Book 3, Chapter 10。Book 3, Chapter 11 of The Sworn Brothers A Tale of the Early Days of Iceland by Gunnar Gunnarsson Translation by Claude Field and W. M. A. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rita Boutros The next day at sunrise they were there. Helga was supported by her brother to shore on the slender landing plank. When she stood on the shore before Jorleif's point and looked over towards the houses, her strength failed her for the second time. She could do no more. She leaned against her brother to save herself from falling. He put his arm round her and led her to a stone where she could sit and recover her strength. There she sat down, and remained sitting, staring out over the sea, that lay resplendent in the glow of sunrise, but her eyes saw nothing. A light morning breeze played with her hair, and gently caressed her pale face. Ingolf stood by her side, waiting. Since she so much wished to see Hjorleif, he would not oppose it, but he wished to follow her and be near her. Helga had forgotten him and why she sat there. For the moment she remembered nothing, except that she was alone, and had your leaf no more. There were times when this fact seemed incomprehensible. If your leaf was dead, why was she alive? She did not understand that. But so it was, she was alive. And die she could not. Death would not come to her, though she prayed for it to all imaginable powers. 
When Ingolf had stood for a while motionless by her side, he bent down over her, and said quietly that he must go for a little to give his men orders. Helga started when he spoke to her, and looked hastily up at him with a terrified look in her eyes. Then she came to herself, remembered why she sat there, why Ingolf stood waiting for her, and she seized his hand. She sat for a while holding it convulsively in hers, and moaning softly. Then she said in that strange distant voice, which quite seemed to have displaced her own, "'Ingolf, I cannot, after all. Let me just sit. I cannot rise. Ah, I can do nothing,' she said, half wailing, and hid her face in her hands. Ingolf stood a little irresolute. Then he bent over her and said softly, "'I will come again and fetch you.' She nodded impatiently with her bowed head, as if begging him only to go, to go. As soon as she no longer heard his steps, she began a low, heart-rending wail. Ah, she had no hope now. Her heart was dead. But she lived, and could not die. Ingolf went back to the ship, helped Halvig and her boy on shore, and asked Halvig to look to Helga while he went and buried Hjorleif. Then he told Viffel and several of his men to take spades and a beer and follow him. The others he set to work unloading the ship. Ingolf was quite composed now. The stamp of the resolute firmness, which was the real expression of his character, was more distinct than ever before. He had reconciled himself to his brother's death as a healthy man reconciles himself to the inevitable. He had sought comfort in his faith, and had eradicated all despair from his mind, so that only a healthy, hardening, beneficial pain remained behind. He remembered the death rune among the omens at the sacrificial feast. It had then pointed at Hjorleif. Yes, fate shields a man till she strikes him. Nothing can alter that. Against fate even the bravest fight in vain. Not even Odin can shake the sentence of the Norns. Such were Ingolf's thoughts as, with a composed mind, he went to carry out his last duty to his brother. There had been an old agreement between him and Hjorleif that, if Ingolf died first, Hjorleif should inter him in a funeral barrow with exact observation of all the ritual of the A's religion. In return, Ingolf had pledged himself, if he were the survivor, to bury Hjorleif in the ground without any kind of solemnity. All that Hjorleif wished, when he no longer lived, was to be buried in a dry spot at the depth of a man's stature, and to lie there with clean earth round him. It was no more than reasonable that he should have his will, though Ingolf in his inmost heart felt a strong impulse to inter him in a barrow, and to do him all the honour which became a chieftain. The birds were singing in the dewy morning, when the sailcloth with which Viffel had covered your leaf was lifted. Their song sounded all at once piercingly in Ingolf's ears. He stood for a while and looked at his brother's decomposed remains. He had seen many dead men, without being specially moved thereby. But now his self-control deserted him a moment. He wept. When he had grown calm again, he made the sign of the hammer over the body, and said softly, as though to himself, A mean fate here befell a good man, that a serf should cause his death, and so it will happen to each one who will not sacrifice to the gods. Hjorleif's corpse was laid on the bier, and Ingolf covered it with his cloak. Then he went on ahead up to the point to seek for a burying place. Step by step the men carried his brother's body after him. Ingolf quickly found a place towards the south and the sun. The grave was dug, and Hjorleif was lowered into it, wrapped in his brother's cloak. Then they cast clean earth over him and trampled it well down. Ingolf remained standing by the grave till his men had gone. Then he spoke for the last time to his sworn brother. "'Your leaf,' he said with emotion and in a natural tone, as though he were quite sure of being heard, "'if no duty had bound me to life, I would have followed you in death. The days are poor without you, brother. 
but i comfort myself with the thought that we shall meet again in valhalla and that you by that time will have made your peace with the gods when ingolf had spoken he took a thunderous stone which hung on a chain round his neck a gift from his mother of whom he had an indistinct memory pressed it deep down in the earth and covered it up nothing in his eye was so sacred as this lucky stone Therefore he gave it to his brother to take with him on the way. Ingolf found his sister where he had left her. She sat in the same attitude. Not once had she moved since he left her. Her wailing had died away. She sat silent. And when he laid his hand on her shoulder, she did not start, only turned her head quietly and looked up wearily at him. She tried to rise, but had become stiff from sitting in the same position. It was some time before she could stand and walk. Ingolf led her gently over the shore, up the point, to Hjorleif's grave. At the grave she remained standing motionless, clinging to his arm, and gazing down at the brown scar in the earth. For the first time since she had heard of Hjorleif's death, her eyes filled with tears, she loosed her hold of Ingolf's arm and asked him impatiently to leave her. When Ingolf had gone, she threw herself on the grave, pressed her face down in the loose earth, and lay there weeping silently and ceaselessly. Now she could weep. Long after Helga had wept all power of weeping out of her soul, she remained lying there with her arms thrown out as though clinging to the earth. Then at last she fell asleep, worn out with sorrow and fatigue. When she woke again, it was evening. She rose and looked around her in alarm, suddenly afraid, lest anyone should see her lying thus. As she stood there and looked around her, she perceived a black round patch on the greensward a little distance off. There had burnt the fire, which about a year ago she had sat gazing at from Ingolf's point. Ah, that red fire! and now it was quenched, quenched forever. Helga sat down, looking alternately at the grave and the burnt patch. Now and then her eyes filled with tears, but she could weep no more. Later in the evening Halvig came silently and sat down by her side. They did not speak. Halvig wept now and then. Helga sat motionless, gazing before her with eyes that scorched and burned, but seeing nothing. The two women remained sitting there the whole night. When sunrise streaked the horizon next day, they rose quietly and went silently homeward to the houses. End of Book 3, Chapter 11book three chapter twelve of the sworn brothers a tale of the early days of iceland by gunnar gunnarsson translation by claude field and w m a this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by rita boutros ingolf sent his men to search for the irish serfs as the boats were gone there was reason to suppose that they had sought flight by sea and as they knew ingolf was in the east it was likely they had rowed farther westward along the coast ingolf's men searched the coast westward for many days journey they saw nothing of the serfs anywhere not even a sign that they had landed and even if they had been drowned their bodies must have been cast ashore neither did they find the pillars of ingolf's high seat which they were also looking for when they returned home and told Ingolf that they had neither found the serfs nor the pillars, he said in his quiet way, The pillars shall be found, and the serfs too, if I have to search the whole country. Ingolf sent Viffel with fifteen men in a boat out to the islands, which from the mountains near the point were visible in the southwest. There Viffel found the Irish serfs. They were living in caves scattered about on the largest of the islands. When they found that they were discovered, panic seized them, and they did not even try to offer resistance. When they saw Ingolf's men coming over the island, they scattered in wild confusion. Some of them were cut down while flying. Others, among whom was Duftak, flung themselves down from the cliffs and promontories and perished. The women 
whom the serfs had taken with them out to the islands, and the most obstinate of whom were still kept bound, were able to tell how Hiorleaf and their husbands had been murdered. They spoke coolly and calmly of the matter. They had forgotten how to weep and how to rejoice. Viffel buried the serfs on the edge of the shore, where the ground is dry at ebb, and covered at full tide, as criminals should be buried. Then he searched each creek and promontory in vain. The pillars had not drifted to shore there. Afterwards he distributed his men in three boats, with the women and the valuables, which the serfs had stolen and taken with them to the islands, among them Hiorleaf's costly sword. Ever since then the islands have been called the Westman Islands after the Irish serfs. Ingolf met the boats down on the shore. Viffel told him of the death of the serfs, recounted the women's narrative of Hiorleaf's murder, and handed him the sword. Ingolf took it cautiously. He remembered the story about Hiorleaf's fight with the dead man, who was reported to have said that a charm attached to the sword whereby everyone who killed with it should himself die by it. Ingolf had comforted himself with the thought that so long as Hiorleaf had not killed anyone with the sword, there was no danger for him from it. Now, however, Hiorleaf had been slain by it. Perhaps the saying meant that whoever possessed that sword should perish by it. At any rate, he would not have it. Sorcery was not to be trifled with. Ingolf went straight to Hiorleaf's grave with the sword, and stuck it in the earth, so that the golden handle projected from the black mould. It was the only thing left by his brother, which he was unwilling to receive. There was no danger of anyone taking it there. His men kept at a distance from Hiorleaf's grave. They asserted that he walked again, and believed that Helga met the dead man when she went up there at night, as she often did. Ingolf did not share their superstition in that respect but on the other hand he well understood how Helga's appearance might give rise to such thoughts in his men. She looked more like a dead man's bride than a young living woman. Her fair hair had become white and hung disheveled about her head. The light of her glance was quenched, and the skin that stretched over her wan, emaciated face was grey and without brightness or colour. The only signs of life she gave were eating and breathing. She carefully took charge of Thorsten, with a peculiar absent tenderness, since Halvig now had a little girl to watch over. She did nothing else. That summer and the following winter Ingolf remained by Hiorleaf's point. The next spring he departed and went farther westward. He stopped at a river whose mouth formed a comparatively safe harbour. Good landing-places were generally scarce on these shores. Thither he had his ships brought. Some way inland, west of the river, he built winter dwellings under a hill, which was named Ingolf's Hill. In the summer, as always, he had his men out to search for the pillars. When they came back, they were able to inform him that they had reached a great promontory. North of the mountains there was a broad fjord. In the winter, Ingolf sent Viffel and Karl to search the coastline north of the hills. Out on a barren promontory in a creek, which, because of some warm, densely smoking springs in the neighborhood, received the name Rogvig, Smoke Creek. Viffel and Karl at last found the pillars. They had drifted ashore just below a little rounded height. On the height there sat an eagle. It did not move when Viffel and Karl approached. It sat there still when they went away, after having secured the pillars. Viffel and Karl were much afraid of the eagle. Only once before had they been equally afraid. That was when the brazen voice from the monk's house had cast them to the ground. Viffel and Karl went back and informed Ingolf of their find. Then Ingolf was glad. Now he knew where he should dwell. Now he caught a glimpse of meaning again in his life. He immediately arranged a great sacrificial feast, and made sacrifices to Odin and Thor, and gave them thanks-offerings. 
When he heard about the eagle, he became thoughtful. Neither he nor anyone else believed that the eagle's having sat there was accidental. There was in Ingolf's mind not the least doubt that the eagle had really been his old father, who, in a shape corresponding to his name, had been sent by Odin to guide and keep watch over the pillars. Never again was an eagle seen on that height, which received the name Orn's Height. As soon as spring came, and the roads were passable, Ingolf left Ingolf's hill, and went over to Rogvig. The place where Ingolf's pillars had drifted ashore was a large, bare promontory. The district was stony, and there was not much pasture land. By far, the greatest number of the parts he had traversed had been better and more suitable for settling, but here it was his lot to dwell and besides he could take possession of as large a territory as he chose, and build houses for his people, and cattle sheds where he found fertile soil. Already that summer Ingolf began to mark out his lands. For himself and his posterity he took possession of the whole of the great promontory, from the river mouth where his ships lay up along its curving course and across the hills, to a fjord on the north side of the promontory, which was named Havalfjord, between two rivers, which received the names of Bringedal River and Oxy River. Many of Ingolf's men were dissatisfied at having to settle in this unfertile region. The serf Karl, in great vexation, ran away with a serf woman. Ingolf found them long afterward settled inland. Ingolf gave land to his freed serf Viffel. He settled on Vifstoft, and Viffel's hill bears his name. He became a well-to-do man. The next summer Ingolf went to Norway to fetch timber for his houses. He built a residence at Rogvik which was not at all inferior to the chief seat of the family at Dalsfjord in Norway. To the residence was attached a temple, which, in its size and splendid equipment, did not fall far short of that at Gollum. Ingolf was faithful to his gods, and showed them great honor. Since they had given him a new place of abode, he felt confidently assured that he had regained their favor. Ingolf, who daily had his sister Helga before his eyes, was often reminded of his sworn brother, Heorleif. Now he understood much which he had not understood before, and caught a sight of the connection between events, which, taken separately, seemed accidental. He remembered the beggar's words, point and blade. Now he understood what the beggar had meant. It was owing to Heorleif's prompting that they had journeyed to Iceland. He or Leif was really the first occupant, even though he had not come to settle there permanently. Fate, the blind and immovable, had been out after him prematurely. Ingolf's heart was moved when he remembered how he or Leif had grown fond of this land from the first. It was accordingly he or Leif whom Iceland had first taken in its embrace. He or Leif was the first who had consecrated the soil of the new land with flesh and blood. Had the gods, or perhaps the guardian spirits of the country, claimed him as a sacrifice? It was, at any rate, a great sacrifice. But Ingolf did not dare to find fault with the gods. Already, the year after Ingolf had settled in Rogvik, people began to flock to the country. They were, for the most part, Norwegian chieftains, who could not come to terms with King Harald. Ingolf gave several of the settlers land in his territory. Among the first settlers was Halvig's brother Lopt, who was called Lopt the Old, and many of his family, which was a good and noble one. Hasten, Atle Jarl's son, was also among the first occupants. He had at last been obliged to leave his own lands and property, and flee the country to save his life. He took some land, guided by his high sea pillars, due east of the river, which bordered Ingolf's territory. Hosten lost his ship when landing, but his property and men were saved. The very next winter he visited Ingolf in Rogvig. 
on the evening of hoston's coming ingolf sat as usual in the high seat with his men at the table round him a step lower the fire burned cheerfully on the hearthstones and spread a genial and penetrating glow the coarsely carved images of the gods on the strongly illumined age-browned pillars of the high seat laughed broadly in the glaring light the talk was lively around the tables and the beer jugs were diligently emptied and filled ingolf was not grudging of beer to his men he sat with a contented look in his peaceful blue eyes and listened to their talk he himself spoke but seldom except when questioned then suddenly there came three knocks at the door all the talking round the table ceased ingolf turned his head and gave a signal to the man at the door the bolt was pushed to one side and in stepped a tall erect fair-bearded man in a red silk cloak with a golden helmet on his head followed by three other men ingolf immediately recognized hoston in spite of his beard and the aging and weary expression of his thin face he sprang up and went to meet him he was too much moved to speak for a while the two former friends stood silent pressing each other's hands and looking each other straight in the eyes then they fell into each other's arms when shortly after they sat side by side in the high seat and had drunk to each other ingolf said i did not know hoston that you were on this road hoston smiled his weary steady smile and answered yes king harold has driven me from the country as i in my time drove you two brothers have you forgiven me that ingolf i have never been angered with you for it ingolf answered they spoke together of many things and their talk was light and untroubled there was in hoston's attitude towards ingolf the same deference that all other chieftains who came there showed the quiet confident simple taciturn man who by his example had drawn all the others to this new land ingolf was indeed his friend and as such he showed him confidence but he was also the first settler in the land and as such he evinced for him a great and undisguised deference they talked of your leaf it happened as i foretold said hoston and smiled sadly the mistletoe branch at last struck the invulnerable we all owe odin a death said ingolf quietly and drew a deep sigh it is most often the survivors whose lot is the hardest his look involuntarily sought the women's dais there sat helga gazing before her without expression in her eyes with his son thorsten in her lap ingolf pointed out the boy to hoston his name is built of thor's name and yours he said in a gentler voice while ingolf talked he noticed how attentively his son's quiet blue eyes dwelt on the high seat pillars thus he had himself sat as a boy he remembered suddenly and now he met his son's look were thorsten's thoughts something like his had been when he was a child hoston had been sitting in silence watching the boy then he said suddenly he must have been born soon after that winter the winter after ingolf answered a little curtly he bears thor's name and mine hoston continued thoughtfully may that bring him good luck he was silent a short time then he asked but who is the woman my sister helga answered ingolf quietly the two friends sat silent a long time then hoston beckoned to the boy and when he came he took him between his knees and looked closely at him you have honest intelligent eyes you will be a brave man he said at last and stroked his fair hair then he took a heavy gold ring off his arm and gave it to Thorsten. "'That is because you are in some part my name's sake,' he explained, smiling at the boy, who stood with the ring in his hand, staring alternately at gift and giver. Thorsten tried the ring on his slender arm. "'It is too large,' he declared, a little offended. Then he suddenly brightened up. "'But it will fit me well enough by the time father is dead and I sit in the high seat.' 
Both Ingolf and Hastin laughed. Thorsten went to show Helga and his mother the ring. Then silence came over the two friends. Shortly after, Ingolf proposed that they should drink to their dead brother. The friends' glances met over the rim of the drinking horns. There were tears in their eyes. They sat late that night and drank and talked together. They were very happy to sit side by side again. The solitude which had threatened to imprison each severally was suddenly banished. Now they had each other again and felt the joy of friendship. The fire burned yellow and brightly on the hearthstones. In its genial warm light, the images of the gods on the carved pillars looked down as if following all that passed with slow content and waiting calmly wise for what should come. End of The Sworn Brothers, A Tale of the Early Days of Iceland by Gunnar Gunnarsson